So these are the two people that allowed us, I don't know, the grace to make this this record that you guys all like and that we're super proud of. And if it wasn't for them, especially back in the day, this kind of company, if we didn't have their backing, we would just, you know, we'd be dust. So I'd like you guys to just give a... that all these people supported you guys yeah, yeah. and it takes that today to make it continue so to you guys yeah. and Steve Hindle on for graciously working through the, yeah. the process Sky and Steve come on up come on up yeah, Sky and Steve yeah. so Sky was a brand new fresh uh -huh. kid who yeah. actually did a bit of engineering on the record and helped in all kinds of ways and assisted and kept Andy in line and, and did all those type of things. And of course, Steve Hindlong, the producer of all of our albums. We got a little band called The Choir that influenced us quite a bit. I've heard of them. <laughs> Pretty good. So, and then, uh, Sky's sister Joy was just a teenage tiny kid that hung out around the studio and probably got influenced in really bad ways. And that's why she has tattoos, but we're, we're praying for her. <laughs> no, and she's here with her son. And uh, But yeah, we're going to get started. Like in Orange County, kind of what we did was talk about a song and play a song. And then you guys can ask whatever you want. This party is for you. We have nowhere to go, we have nothing to do except hang out with you guys and be thankful that we're, the barrier between bands and bands is broken now, we're all just friends tonight, just hanging out, so, um, any question is good. For nostalgia, I want a picture. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's Wayne? Where is Wayne? Where's Wayne? Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Well, I think it was a, I remember reflecting back on the days when, when we started all of this and how, uh, honestly, uh, guess daring is the word. Uh, I'll never forget the first time I went to Southern California to see you guys play, and uh, it was a really moving experience, and uh, I wasn't quite sure how in the world we would make it work from a record company standpoint, but all I knew was there was passion and there was uh, an energy on stage that I, I had never seen before. And uh, so, I, you know, I, I'm thankful that we worked at a company that was willing to take a chance on something this far out of the box. And to, to see the to see the response to the music is always exciting. But uh, you know, we, I just thank you guys for the for all the great memories. Uh, they're still they're still tucked away in the recesses of my brain, <laughs> but they are uh, some great memories and, and uh, just honored to be able to be here tonight. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. thank so, you, you guys, this company was putting out Michael W. Smith, Pop Girl, and Kathy Control. Control. Had a little bit of wine, and uh, this guy Gary Chapman, and so. We were so far out of that thing. Like there was only tiny little indie labels even thinking about giving something that was so far out of the box a chance. So the fact that the big national We made label, our own tiny little indie yeah, label. Yeah. It, was, <laughs> it was a cool thing. And um, actually a lot of bands that are our peers like were very envious of the amount of resources that we had backing us and yeah. budgets well, and I, things. You know, we went on to work with Third Day, obviously, as well. And uh, they wanted to be a reunion because of you guys. Mm -hmm. You know, Matt Powell was like, we want to be a reunion because they've got the prayer chain. You know, so, uh, you Did know, you, you get guys more money on third day or the prayer chain? <laughs> 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 I 
it all works out in the end, right? <laughs> I remember hanging out with Third Day once, and they were releasing some record, and it was like a week after they released it, and they sold like 110,000 copies in one week. And I said, guys, do you understand you sold more copies in one week than we did of all of our records combined for our whole career? <laughs> Yeah, but you guys inspired me. Well, I'll tell you what. We went to play at Flavo Festival in Holland. Yeah, come on. Yeah. And we were playing in a side tent. They have, they make, you would play a side stage and then you oh. play the main stage. And yeah. this band opened for us named Third Day. Oh, really? Awesome. We never heard <laughs> of them. Yeah. We didn't know them. And they, they played Sweet Home Alabama. Yeah. It's so, <laughs> exciting, man. Right? Yeah. Uh, should, should we get Wayne? Can, can you see you? What? Can't see Wayne. We can't, can't see Wayne. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Oh, hey, get it. Oh, hey, get it. Oh, hey, get it. Oh, hey, get it. We used to do that. We would take photos like this with people at shows, and then they would send us a copy of the picture. And you know, we kind of one after the other, and I feel bad for the fans because they never got a straight picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> Someone is always sure. mugging in the shot. Yeah. We'd, we'd get them back, we'd look at them and be like, oh. <laughs> 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 oh they ruined their picture. <laughs> <laughs> Do y'all have a Twitter handle? <laughs> What's Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> so old already? What, what, what? <laughs> you are useless. It's like a postcard. <laughs> <laughs> it's like ancient Instagram. It's like ancient Instagram. All right. Yeah, so these, the lady and the gentleman here were the reason why we're here today, and it's awesome. And I'm super stoked that we were able to eat a third day. So, everyone like, <laughs> <laughs> made money. At the end of the day, we didn't lose anything on the third chain. So, we're happy. And, and plus, I mean, it's just... You're, you're here today because of God. Yeah, that's right. Go there. No, because of you. <laughs> <laughs> We're here today in this house because of you guys. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. But yeah, thank you for our friends. You guys treated us to good times in yeah. Nashville too. It was fun to come out here for <laughs> and do stuff and eat good food and yeah, pancake hang out. Yeah, yeah. 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 pancake factory. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Let's, let's All right, listen. listen. I have a yes. question. Yes, is, sir. Is the A and R rep that had tacos with you guys and asked you if you were all right? Is that's Chris. That's Chris. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had that, that conversation was, that quite often. Yeah. last year on the internet. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. We had that. We often uh, times wondered if we were all right. Yeah. 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 You want to respond to it? Well, I think I'll refer. <laughs> No, we, we did have that conversation quite often. But you know, it's come, it, it came with the territory of, of the type of artists that they were, and, and the type of music they were doing, and the fans they were they were reaching, and, and uh, the way that they were, their the way the way that they framed the gospel was just a unique and different way. And so with that, it just always it was going to bring. We knew going into it, it was going to bring a different type of uh, expression. Audience, yeah. yeah. Different type of expression and a different type of audience. So, you know, and I think we did pretty well. Migrating through some of those challenging ones <laughs> at yes. times. Cool. Yeah. I would say we some challenges. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and one more special guest that we, it's pretty much a band member, is Jeremy Wood, who toured the Mercury wow. record with us yeah. as percussionist and multi instrumentalist and mainly like was the glue that kept us together in the van yep. because he's so freaking funny and just an awesome hang and were you with them when they were naked going into graceland Can we talk about that <laughs> <laughs> sorry my bad it was that other band i thought you had to leave it <laughs> 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 okay then, well it was just the 
was the natural state. I, I was making fun of you. Every time we went to Arkansas, it's the natural state. We would all get in the natural state yeah. and drive the entire way to the state of Arkansas. Naked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, the things that came to tour. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy and Wayne were. Jeremy and Wayne were very much in sync. You know, when we played a lot of shows during that record. And Jeremy would be sitting right there to the right of Wayne's kit, and they developed this thing where. In certain songs, they had the timing down. Jeremy would be singing background vocals, which was hugely helpful, and shaking tambourines and stuff. And then Wayne would do a fill, and Jeremy would know that, that it was coming and reach out and grab the cymbal, so it would be like a crash cymbal <laughs> pinch. <laughs> just like, oh, and Wayne would go, do, 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 and Jeremy would just pinch like that. I didn't even look at him, you know, like they had this whole thing like worked out. It was so fun. I turned around just watching this and do these things. It was incredible. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess the last, last thing. So there you go. No, it's not. What? I was just asking if I get a copy. Chris is asking about the vinyl, which you guys all know got pushed back by months because Andy did not like the first, second, third, or fourth version of the mastering. <laughs> Fired people, moved. And you recall that we were trying to raise $3,000 and we raised $21,000. You're like, what are you going to do with all that money? It got spent. <laughs> it's all spent on mastering. <laughs> and it's part of it. Someday, in the near future, you will have a copy. the best possible copy of Mercury. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 The last thing, just real fast, is... Our friend Nacho is not here, and he was part of this band just as much as all of us are. And I don't know, he's doing some Taylor Swift stuff, and he really wanted to be here. And that guy, I remember, I'm just gonna tell this story, and then we can start listening to the record, because no one cares about this story, but I do. So you have to listen for two minutes. You have so, to change that, have I know. Yeah. All right. Just listen to no more. <laughs> So Tim's like, hey man, I got this guy named Tim that he wants to be a roadie because we need a roadie. I'm like, all right. So we're going up to uh, San Francisco. He's like, he's going to drive and be the roadie. I'm like, okay, cool. So we're going to San Francisco. We have to go over the Golden Gate Bridge. And Tim, who's like 17, 18 years old, probably should not even be driving. <laughs> and just, he... I apologize to anyone who here is a Mexican or a beaner, but he wore a white beater and he looked like a beaner. But it, he was working he's, construction, so he was super tan. Yes. And he had Chris Cornell like facial hair yeah. and long hair. And he just he, he's a white guy that looks like a beaner. Truly Hispanic. So I'm like, hey man, your name's fucking Nacho. <laughs> that's, that's what you do because we have a Tim. We don't need another Tim. 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 Yes. <laughs> so we're going across the Golden Gate Bridge, and he's driving the van with a trailer, and of course, plows into a woman that is pregnant <laughs> on the Golden Gate Bridge. It hits her, and we're like, "Oh my gosh, what did we do?" And so, like, we walk over, her and she's like, "I'm fine. We're all fine." And like I, I can't remember if I was talking to you or Andy or Wayne. I'm like, dude, he just hit a pregnant woman on the Golden Gate Bridge, doing like four miles per hour. Like, hey, do we want this guy? Here? And someone's like, oh, that's all we got. <laughs> Nacho, you're in. And so like Nacho is, you know, always part of this family. If you saw us play, and you saw Nacho. I mean, yeah, he was with us the whole time. And he's like, you know, yeah, he's part of the band just as much as all these people. And just really took care of us because when we'd leave at night from, you know, whatever, whatever show, like he would do the first six hours and then I'd have to do the next six hours. So that's, he was the guy that always took care of us. How much did I drive? Never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just, yeah. So me and Nacho just drove a lot and he was the guy that took care of me and Jeremy would stay up on occasion and so did Wayne. But, you know, so... Yeah, so, you know, cheers to Nacho. Everyone, Nacho! 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 All right, so uh, if anyone else has any stories or thoughts or... Can I tell more Nacho story? Yeah. <laughs> well, just make sure it's appropriate. Nacho's trademark was, you could always see him 
pumping gas while smoking a cigarette <laughs> and reading a novel. <laughs> the guy was a prolific like fiction reader, and he would just be smoking, reading, and pumping gas at the same time, and that's talented. Yeah. <laughs> and one of my favorite nacho stories is like going to Florida and like you'd fall asleep in the van and you would never know like when you're gonna wake up where you're at. And so <laughs> I wake up and I look out the window of the van and I'm foggy and there's just sand and an ocean. And I'm like, where are we? And like Nachin's up, he's probably reading and he's on a bike path on the beach in Florida. And I'm like, how the hell did you get here? And he's like, I don't know, man. <laughs> so it was a beautiful setting to wake up to. Just thinking about y'all. All right. Well, Nacho has gone on. He he is a professional roadie. He's worked for Metallica, Aerosmith. He's had Steven Tyler yell at him every single night of a tour. Uh, he was with Katy Perry. They brought Taylor, all of Nacho. Yeah. Taylor Swift, Justin Timberlake. Very, very, he's done... Who's yeah. that one girl that grabbed his ass? That was Alicia Keys. Alicia Keys. <laughs> oh, yeah. So there's a story of... <laughs> Nacho and another guy would have to open this like door Sliding for Alicia to Keys to, come to like make her grand entrance. And so Nacho's back there grooving to the beat and dancing. The, the band's out there playing, and waiting for her to come He's out. shaking his ass. <laughs> and all of a sudden he gets this big grab from behind and he turns around and it's Alicia Keys. <laughs> <laughs> so we gave that kid the start. <laughs> yeah. We gave them third day, we Sorry. gave Nacho to the <laughs> <script. laughs> We're just givers. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. You? All right, let's get out here. Yeah. We're going to get at least one track. It's not that <laughs> Oh, and sneak in along. Yeah, yeah. The producer. Oh, he's all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say something. Say something. Make sure it's really good too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just want to say that um, Andy's going to play each side, and um, there's four sides, and the songs are kind of long, so it's probably about three songs on a side, right? And uh, we want you to ask questions. And uh, it's so funny because we all remember it completely differently. <laughs> Twenty years ago, and uh, it's really fuzzy, but. Um, we want to talk about, I, I love telling the stories, I want to tell you about these guys. People say, people often, when you work with a band, they say, what were those guys like? Well, it's four different guys. It's four different stories. And, uh, so it's really interesting. Uh, I think there's a lot of fascinating things about the record. Uh, I will say that of all the records I've worked on over the years, um, you never know, you know, what's going to be buoying and what's not. And um, it was just like, on to the next, for me, I was like busy all the time and I was on to the next, trying to make the next hundred bucks, you know. And so I, it was like, I never would, but over the years, people have asked me about Mercury probably more than any other record I've worked on. And uh, I just kept, it's, yeah. <laughs> I would have thought that. I would have thought that's very interesting. I love talking about it. It was a very unusual situation. Um, I will, I, I want to set the setting. It was, it was 95, wasn't it? 94. 94, all right, whatever. <laughs> yeah, so I remember differently. But it was August, right? No, there was a. Were you even there? We talked about the mountain days. We recorded in July because we went to Cornerstone in the middle. Of it. Where's Wayne? Right here. Remember, our, you know, we talked about we we after the last thing in LA, you and I talked about how long the record took, and I said it took 18 days, and you said no, it took only nine, and we're like that part. Yep. Yeah. But we have it written in the liner notes that we it was recorded in July. Because we went to Cornerstone. Yeah. Cornerstone was oh, yeah, always like right. July 4th. So we yeah. Went to Cornerstone, right? We literally go to Cornerstone because it you guys could literally. Why did you guys ask me to talk? I just asked me to talk. I don't know. But it was hot. Feel okay. free to ask as many questions as you'd like. From <laughs> <laughs> here on out, don't believe anything I say, but I'll make shit up and I'll say it the best I can. So, I didn't say drink, then talk. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Oh man, 
so I went, I know that here, here's me. I went to a lot. I had just moved. We did the, we did Shaw all together in, in California, Southern Cal. I lived there, uh, and then I moved to Nashville, and those guys still wanted to work for me, and they had a record label in Nashville, so they came all the way out. And I had just moved in '93, and it was like the very next year, right? So you guys came out. I don't know if you flew or drove. I don't even remember. Joe. Drove. Oh, All right. Just broke down in Colorado. Uh, but before that, I had flown. You guys had flown me out to L.A. and we worked for three days on pre-production. Right. We had all the titles on the blackboard, and I'm like, oh my god, they have no songs. <laughs> <laughs> so we're writing titles like Bendy Line because of the guitar line. Da -na 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 -na. All the songs are like just made up names, you know, because we haven't put the lyric. You know, it's like what. Uh, but we put it together. We had a really good three days. I was able to come back and, and Tim Smith, you know, I, Chris. Chris Smith, Chris, Chris Smith, I'm sorry, Chris. My brother's dead. Last time we saw each other was back there. <laughs> we back there, right? Show. And I'm like, I gotta tell him, you know, hey, we got you were like, because you're like, you know, we don't have to do it now. We can do it later. We can make sure they're ready, make sure yeah. they're ready. I'm like, are you kidding, man? I need that 3,000 bucks so bad. <laughs> <laughs> there, is no, there is no way that they're not going to be ready, man. You know? So I would tell you, oh, yeah, 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 it's ready. It's ready, it's ready. You know? So they, it's fine. It's going to be great, right? <laughs> and you're like, I don't think so. But I'm not like, we both knew, you know. Take you two can, steps forward. Right, two, just mix right. board is. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the, guy, the three guys come out. Tim is on his honeymoon. Tim uh, Tabor gets married right then, right? Goes on his honeymoon. So we start out, and it's just uh, Andy and Eric and Wayne. And uh, we have two weeks. That's how I remember it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, how many? How much time do we have? What's that? How, before Tim got there, how much time did we have in, in, in uh, I thought it was like I thought it was like two weeks or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, but the, all I know is that Andy picked, Andy has a car. I'm in a, I'm in a vehicle with Andy. I don't remember if I'm driving or he's driving or if it's a rental car, it's my car. I don't remember that. But I remember we're driving around and uh, we haven't started yet. And he says to me, because Eric is going to be writing all the lyrics. He says, I told Eric. I don't care what he writes about, as long as two things are covered. Numbness and death. <laughs> right? That's it. It's also rare for Andy to make a big speech. <laughs> So that was particularly like poignant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we really gotta listen because Andy's not gonna well, go out on a limb we'll, that much. You we'll know, try to make like... sure that happens. <laughs> right, right. We'll try to make sure the numbness and death happens. <laughs> <laughs> and it did. <laughs> so the first song on the record is one of the last ones recorded, right? Sort of? Hum? Yes. It was kind of toward the end. We, yeah. we made the album in thought that there wasn't enough droning type music on it, so we had to put the thumb on there to like add some more of that quality to the record. And, uh, yeah, what, what else about, do we, well, we'll just listen yeah, to After we get through a side, we, we'll, we can talk about any of the stuff involved in the song. Right. There's some fun stories. I just hope this all works. <laughs> Correctly. If it, it's, it's a false start, please forgive.
Melissa's party, I went into some and possibly too many technical details about recording stuff, but there's someone here who might know even more than me. Sky is here, and Sky was there assisting Chris Colbert, who is not here because Chris is the live sound man for Neon Bridges right now, so he's on tour. But uh, we mixed the whole record, and then we went back and recorded two more songs, and then Chris Colbert was, I think, did you assist on the remixes that Chris did, or did he do them by himself? He had to do some remixes to turn up the vocals. So Water Dogs right there yeah. is a vocal up mix that they did at Neverland. I'm not remembering if I was there for the remixes, yeah. like the turning the vocals up. Okay. I was and there then, for the originals, though. Yeah. yeah. So the third song, Grillia, that was mixed in California by Gene at the Green Room. And then uh, Hum, as I know, that one is was mixed at Neverland by Colbert. Um, but which was manual, just to, yeah. just to mention that. Which All was the mixes were manual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's three chairs over here if anybody wants any. Yeah, three chairs here. Does anyone understand you, how many uh, musicians are here? <laughs> okay, how many are like engineers that make records and things? Right, so pretty much you're in automation, you're on Pro Tools and stuff, right? Did anyone here do records on analog? Yeah, which is just uh, take. Explain the difference between a manual mix and an automated mix, Andy. Well, I'll start off with one thing. You're going to see me over here playing air drums through the whole record because Wayne is my favorite drummer of all time, and also this record has some kick a drum parts. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me, jump in, let me jump in on one thing, because yeah. the trivia, I love the trivia of it, like Wayne always did creative things with what he hit with, like the very first song, he had brushes, you know brushes with the rubber, and the, he retracted the brushes, and he played the whole song with the rubber end, of the stick, you know what I mean, so you hear that thumpy, yeah. you know, thing, it's not a regular stick, you know, and a lot of times, like what he's hitting the, with the drums yeah. with are not a stick, it's some other kind of, I've got to do something different. You yeah, know? that was the, every song we tried to yeah, approach so. all that stuff from a different one, and Wayne especially. And so like, the reason I, I love the drumming on this is a song like Grilliad is a drum composition, and we tried to track it live, the three uh, musician playing at the same time kind of thing, but Wayne was composing as he went along and he just kind of needed more time to work it out. So it worked out. But I mean, if you listen to that song, top to bottom, drum wise, it's like a, you know, it's fantastic. And he, that's what this record was. was he, especially with the percussion that we get to later, like he sat in there and worked his butt off composing this thing. And when you listen back to it, it's just every drum fill, every little thing, it's like, but it's all on tape. You had to just play it. Yeah. Once through that way, you know what I mean? Like that's, it's nearly nobody does that anymore <laughs> at all. And even back then, you know, they in more, I don't know, higher end studios, they would tape edit a lot of stuff. I mean, Hackbarth did that on our first demo stuff. So. Cuts and tape. Yeah, but it's like yeah. it's very time consuming and difficult. Yeah. And when you're you know under the gun time wise, that's like something's going. Well, let's just get it, you know. And well, I was so bad at, at tempo. Uh, you know, I couldn't play to a click to save my life. <laughs> so the very first demos that we did, I think Dave Hackbarth, who engineered it, he had to cut that thing just, I mean, there was barely any tape left. It was all like, you know, <laughs> tape holding everything together. You know, you just like spliced the hell out of that thing. So for me, like, you know, trying to approach the drums with this band was like always like, okay, I'm not never going to be the greatest, you know, uh, you know, uh, technically. You know, so I gotta find ways to, you know, make the drum parts exciting or interesting in some way. And so, for me, you know, meeting uh, Steve and being sort of, you know, uh, inspired by his direction and his thinking about the drums, you know, and for him, it's like, you know, he's he's a songwriter, so he thinks about it, you know, from a songwriter's perspective, and so that really taught me a lot about how to play the drums and what to listen for and then what can, you know, the kinds of things that can take it to a different place than just your standard sort of drum playing, you know. And so um, that was always kind of a, an inspiration for me, especially when we did these sessions because it was like, how are we going to, you know, make this an interesting record? And so uh, I was like, well, 
you know, I could play this with sticks or how about try something else because, you know, maybe Steve will like that <laughs> better than like something more conventional. So it was really in inspiring for me. And then also the sound of the, the drums especially were very much the sound of that studio, the room that they had built, the microphones used, the, the U47, that was like the room mic and all, yeah, like that. And the board they had was this ancient Neve console, tape machine was a studer. It was like the stuff, like that you dream of recording on. And so, you know, we, that was a big deal uh, for this record. And we mixed from, when we did the mix downs, they were mixed to tape, you know, and stuff. So it was like, we went for the sonic quality. Even though like we're playing with junky guitar sounds and you know doing all this stuff, I mean it's like you know noisy yeah, yeah. stuff or whatever, like kind of trying to preserve the sonic quality of the other. The, thing, the amount of time that went into those guitar sounds, <laughs> yeah. those were not junky guitar sounds. No, but no, I was like, no, I'm saying whatever, man. What are you talking about? It's amazing guitar sounds. I wanted, I wanted to, to say that Gorilla in particular. That was one when we were touring, I was playing um, the percussion. The, the funny thing about that song is that was probably the one song of the whole set that I was doing the least of anything. I was really just starting out with Shakers and then doing tambourines on that one. Which song? Uh, that was really the last one that we listened to on that side. And when I first heard this album and was um, you know, I was blown away. I loved it as much as you guys love it. That song in particular was, it always was my favorite. And then when we um, were rehearsing it, and, you know, Wayne and I have done a lot of stuff together in the drums over the years, but um, I was always trying to maintain, like, whatever I did live with them and with Wayne was always supposed to be, in my mind, just to, to do our best to emulate, like, the essence of the record. It was always going to sound a little different live, or anything, inevitably does, but that song in particular is, you guys are talking about, like, the tempo and the, the sort of, like, randomness and the brokenness, and it's evident on that song and, and the guitars, everything, it does, it does sound kind of jumbly, you know, everything's loose and, and unpolished, and that's what makes that song very, um, it's us, enrapturing, you know, you just, you, you get lost in it, and it's got a looseness that you can just kind of glide around on and get lost in, at least I did, and um, so playing live, I would, I would do a lot of, uh, like the downbeat stuff, because Wayne was doing a lot of eighth notes with those toms, and then, you know, some of those fills and stuff, so on that one, I just did my best to just with the shakers and stuff, just keep hitting those like yeah. the quarter note downbeats, which right. actually provided sort of like the backbeat groove so that Wayne's looseness was always loose, but it just it kept having that like chug along like the record has. And um, it was just a real pleasure playing that song, even though it was one that I, you know, technically was doing, you know, very little. And then I sang backups um, throughout you know, all the songs where there are backups, but this one in particular, Tim and I would do that harmony thing at the end. And we kind of, when we were rehearsing it, I think even we started the tour and it wasn't, we were really unsure who was gonna hit that harmony and all that stuff. And then I just ended up like doing it because we could nail that thing every time. I would do that low part, Tim was doing the high part. And so anyway, all that is to say that um, that's kind of how it affected me uh, listening to it, how it affected me live. And when I say affected, like, you know, emotionally, and it was just a very, um, that was the song that I loved the most from this album, and it um, was the one I looked forward to playing every night, like, it was just a thrill, even though I was hardly doing anything, and then we'd sing that part at the end, it was just epic, and that was, anyway, there's a little tidbit, so when I'm listening to it with you guys, it's just, I mean, that's, that's my, uh, that's the high point on the record for me of that track, that last one. Anybody have any questions? Joel, yeah, I, I, I got a question. Um, so like all this, um, all through the record, I hear like little details that sound like they could be like studio bits that you decided to work into the mix. I'm wondering like like the laugh on Gilead, like right before the second verse, is that 
That's Wayne playing the violin and laughing at himself. That's like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. so I was wondering if it was at that moment or if you guys found the moments on the tape and put it. it just it happened. Why did you get that violin? That was my grandfather. My grandfather was a violin maker, and he uh, made a violin for each one of his grand, you know, four grandkids. But he made one for each of them. And there's a kind of a legend story in our family where um, he used to be a, an airplane parts um, pattern manufacturer in uh, in Inglewood, and he would um, he'd be like, all right, I'm going to the shop, you know, to make some patterns or whatever. And but he had a separate sort of shop that he had kept secret from my grandmother, where he would go and build violins and stuff. <laughs> so he'd be like, yeah, I'm going to the shop. And she's like, oh, okay, cool. He's going to the parts manufacturer place. He was going to build his own violins. So. Yeah, that was a really he special moment. Took the violin in Wayne's hand and he just he played those screechy things that kind of sink up down in that first one and then he just played that part and just kind of giggled because it's like, what am I doing? You know, that kind of laugh. It's like, no. it sounds awesome. It sounds like a sinister laugh. It's a little one good. take. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> it's, it's so exciting to like get things on t on tape, you know, I still call it on tape, but in that case it was on tape. You know, that no one else, it doesn't sound like anything else. Yeah. How often does a guy that cannot play the violin play the violin on a recording? It just doesn't happen very often, and he did it perfectly yeah. for the song. I mean, absolutely captured, crack the crickets crackle, you know. Wow, it's incredible. And you'll never hear you will never hear anything that sounds like that on any record ever. That is artistic success. <laughs> yeah. So maybe maybe this is a this is too broad of a question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. You know that the opening two tracks or even the opening three tracks of this are so different than the opening tracks of Shawl. And what happened in the songwriting, like in the two years or three years or four, however many years there were between the writing for Shaw and then the writing for Mercury? What happened there? That, the that writing for Shaw was all as a band jamming in a room, like at full volume, you know, rocking out and attempting. At the time, we were trying to scale up the energy of the shows to make an impression that way. So, like, Shaw reflected that total just big push you know and then we rebooted completely for this and we wrote in Tim's living room with a djembe and an acoustic guitar and or electric with a tiny amp super quiet so all the writing for this started that way and then we did some more writing when Steve came out in the rehearsal we took but we were just kind of it was quietly in a room instead of blaring full volume trying to push that so that's the main difference is that those two contexts, like when Shaw was like, this is just a band that is live that plays this way, and then this was like, you know, a whole different thing. Can I ask a follow-up question? Somebody has, I played this for somebody before, and they have compared it to Peter, Peter Gabriel's um, soundtrack, The Last Temptation of Christ. Was that... Rightfully so, since we were listening to that all the time. <laughs> there you go. All right. Highly influenced, to say the least. By yeah. The okay. Awesome. Whoops. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, well, what I was wondering was, is there like a world music? I mean, I, he kind of answered that with that, but like, like there's a tribal in both Shawl and Mercury that I kind of hear that, that I really, I love it. But I'm just wondering, like, what kind of inspired... It was all that music that we were listening to. Yeah. It was the Peter Gabriel stuff, and then it was all the indigenous music, and and just you know, kind of inspired by something that was different than rock and roll, and and trying to figure out a way to incorporate some of that. And for me, being inspired by Steve because he was so into percussion and stuff, and so we you know geek down on that, and you know like to just kind of you know find you know sounds or you know different ways to sort of incorporate world music into the. Into the song. I remember you guys playing a cassette of some, of just insects and some guys. Yeah. <laughs> You're really into this earth connection thing. I would say one other important band that we used to actually drive around listening to one particular song yeah. over and over again was Dead Can Dance. Oh, yeah. 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 And so that was a big thing too. We were like, how do we do this as a rock band? Like that was <coughs> driving at night after a show. Trying to figure that out. But, mm -hmm. um, Afghan rigs. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> part of the budget of the record is Wayne and Steve got a few hundred dollars to go buy 
cool, trippy, interesting percussion things, you know, just have fun and, you know, Boom. pick up stuff. That was kind of my question, actually, and that's why I said it was kind of a follow-up to that, is because I sense like this Middle Eastern influence, very heavy. Mm -hmm. And when I first heard it, especially from the first song, and then you listen to the end, there's this huge Middle Eastern influence that obviously was completely not there with Shaw, because Shaw was like a live capture, you know, was a recorded capture of the live experience, right? And then you go into Mercury, and it's this like super heavy, like like you said, ethnic world music kind of thing. And that was going to be my question was, you know, how did that come about? Which, I mean, that makes total sense. This got really an influence and Wayne was figuring out the rhythms from things like Drummers of Burundi and stuff. He was like, that's like really and all these things. The drum patterns are lifted from that kind of stuff, you know. And so the next song is Creole and the, the main beat that's in it that starting you hear the djembe at the beginning because that's how we wrote it and that's a it's just like a certain pattern of tribal yeah. Yeah, it's like a west african yeah basic and, and the peter gabriel record like that stuff was super influential because it, it he contextualized the uh, the whole jesus thing a little different you know it was like there was that was kind of the music of that. That's what he did with his record, you know, sort of like, we were trying to bring in sounds and rhythms and all these things that might, you know, put that stuff in, in that context like he did. You know, it's just it was very, and we were just stoked on like I said, dead came into it. This feeling, this is the feeling. <laughs> One other thing too about the percussion um, of the, from those records, he's talking about the Peter Gabriel one, and then he had, he had a, a sister record for that. The album he did was called Passion, and then the, he had a, a record supplement was Passion Source, and then it was all the, That's the original um, yeah. world artists doing their own stuff that he, you know, lit literally got used that as his sources for that album. Both are really haunting and, and very good listens. And then, as Danny mentioned, Wayne was playing that Drummers of Burundi thing and getting us all into that. But the cool thing about this particular record and the material is we, as we did this stuff, even in rehearsal, uh, we varied stuff a little bit from the record. Um, not deliberately, but just sort of out of necessity. Like, you can't do it exactly like that every time where there's a weird looseness and we would come up with something that, you know, we could sort of count and end, you know, rather than just sort of like fade some of the stuff. And then some of it literally just happened over time you know, the more we're playing on tour, the stuff started sounding differently too. But the wonderful thing about this record is that, again, that openness and that looseness, we, we were just creating on top of it new parts and, and Water Dogs on that first, the second track, this first side, was a perfect example. The end of that, the guitars are, are going out and then that little thing comes in. So instead of just doing that little part on the thing, Wayne and I came up with this entire, like, heavy hitting floor tom thing and then I added the tambourine and we literally did the like drummers of Burundi kind of riff in there. It was very exciting. It was exciting for us to play but it also was a very exciting thing for the people listening because it was um, energetic and it was just the drums while this noise was droning out but, yeah. it, but it was entirely you know inspired just by the looseness of the record there, that there was that um, little pocket to just create something cool in there. I have a question. Um, it's not about this album, but since the conversation went tribal, um, I like one of my favorite things ever is on the Antarctica CD where you guys did the uh, the uh, Native American Indian type chant into round. Like, how does that actually come together? Like, I I, I mean, is so it just playing and all of a sudden? We it, doing yeah. that we were sourcing all these things, and then Wayne put a bunch of them together on a dat, and we would play those some of the, those, that exact material in between songs live. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, transitional things and stuff. And the round that you hear on Antarctica is kind of, you know, we did round on Shaw, and the live version is more like, kind of, oh, that's what we should have done. If, it, mm -hmm. if the band that made Mercury had done round, it would have been like this. And so we just, you know, reconfigured it post Mercury, but Wayne did a good job of finding all that stuff to go on in the in-between things live, like the, the set 
was laid out pretty cool with all that like the right thing would go into the right song and like you, you figured all that stuff out it was awesome I still have those guys so Tim your your vocals on this record like so you've got this great big powerful voice and so a lot of times when you perform live like there's just this sort of fastness to the way that you but on this record there's a lot of moments where you sing sort of very there's a there's a delicacy to the way that you sing like there's a there's a sort of a sweet tenderness to it that typically you don't do as much in the, like how, how does that how did that work for you because even even if you go in back and like if I listen to the live takes from like the Mercury tour there's sort of a bigness again in your voice like so why did you choose to approach this record vocally the way that you did and then why did why approach it the tour live the way that you did the tour I probably just get too excited and just like <laughs> revert to old habits but it was deliberate with Steve and Andy and Wayne um, it really like Steve's a producer Andy was probably a lot of the musical like director they all had a lot of vision for it yeah. and you know the cool thing about these guys creating music is like Andy talking about Wayne working on drum parts like it seems like a lot of guys would just kind of play a beat and be okay with it but he kept, keeps tweaking and changing and adjusting and so it wasn't about just like sing it like normal it was like experimentation and trying different things and in the same way Shaw had a different sound than Mercury how do we change things on all levels you know okay. and so that was the process like don't just do it like you would always do it like and you know I think we had a good amount of time in the studio that's an yeah. argument but we had a real record label that had you know, real record budgets. And so it afforded us a chance to do some experimentation and trying different things. And so that was one of the things is we could try different things and that's what you're hearing. Yeah. But frankly, just live, I just get super into it. And yeah, I just well, kind of like I said, we wrote these songs quietly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know I mean? We had never played them in that live big situation. And it was a deliberate thing because we, when we were playing live, at that point, the shows had developed into just a stage diving excuse. <laughs> yeah. kind of all it, was. it was like mosh pits. Yeah. So this was a deliberate like response to that to, to like sort of hush the voice down so that be like, everyone would be like, oh, I can't stage dive. I gotta like try and listen. You know. Like, I can, that's <laughs> there's there's a lot of fun in the high energy stage diving shawl show. But like when it came out, it was surprising for me. Like the reaction was so strong from the crowd. But it, it was a little bit easy that like when you write these type of things, people are gonna react a certain way. And then what became fun at the beginning of that, like I don't know if this comes off as pretentious or weird, but it kind of became irritating because you spend time creating something and then there was live shows that didn't seem like it was about the music it was just like some dude jumping off stage like it could have been any band and any song and it didn't matter because it was just about jumping in the crowd and so some of i i think shaw's a good record like and it has like some cool nuances and a lot of musicality to it and you know, we can't always choose what the crowd does or whatever, but it seemed like a lot of the music was getting lost. And so I think Mercury was a chance to say, how can we create an experience where people are drawn to the music? And that's not just about jumping off stage and crushing people's heads. Did that, right. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, this is a very sophisticated question. <laughs> Maybe you should ask Eric. <laughs> I'm going to ask Andy. Andy, Eric left. Andy, there's a flood coming, and you need to put one guitar, one amp, and three effects pedals in your arc. Whoa! <laughs> put it in your arc. We'll talk about that later. Okay. What's the short answer? That will, that will, me and you will. What's right, the short answer? We, we all, well, the short answer would be the, the gold jazz master. 
that one, and I have a box AC30, I did not want to part with that thing. Um, X, innumerable pedals, so I don't know there which ones, but if I just had that guitar and that amp, I could probably do it. <laughs> I was just gonna ask, like back to the vocal thing with this album, was that did that come e was that easy to do, or did did you have to like go off and really practice and think about changing things and how you approached it? Vocally? I think when I got some direction um, and experimented, it felt natural. Okay, like it didn't felt like I wasn't being me, mm -hmm. but it was cool to not go to like. I think there's a thing in my voice when I really go for it, and it's almost like easier to throw out this big emotional, anthemic thing. So it's like, how do you create music and not use that, which is almost like a little bit of a cop out thing, right. and still express emotion or lack of emotion and the lyric properly, and all these things without just relying on that big, you know, like rock and roll thing so but it it, it stretched me um, but it didn't feel weird at the end it got to a place where it felt cool cool and as I remember it we we just had Steve working with Tim on the vocals we just kind of let him go and they close the control room door and we kind of stand out in the hall and listen through the door a little bit and occasionally like pop our head and go like a little more like that maybe you know or whatever but most of the time we just kind of show up. we let them we let him basically do those things with Tim where Tim would try stuff and Steve would uh, coach him through no now you can tell you want me to your tell perspective. that please tell your perspective you want to me to tell <laughs> yeah so one so one time Tim's saying in you know like, and I don't know why where's Eric He's hiding out. He's the better. There he is. He's always hiding out. Eric's my favorite thing about the career chain. <laughs> Absolutely. Not even close. You go to three guys. Not even close. <laughs> I love Eric. His bass playing, his whole personality, his whole thing. I just, I just love Eric. But um, he's so unpredictable. I don't know what he's going to do. But anyway, so... so um, He's really, really sweet and kind and gracious. Kind of, kind of, kind of a mean thing in you, right? You got a little, <laughs> little mean thing. He's a little mean. Yeah, yeah, really there's, <laughs> there's something a little bit wrong with you, and I don't know what it is. <laughs> but uh, mostly just beautiful, you know. And so melodic, melodic bass player. That's what bass is all about: is melody, you know. Lay it down, hold down the bottom end, please. Bring some melody. Don't noodle around. Don't, no attention getting behavior up, noodling around up your neck, ruin the song, calling attention to yourself. Hold the bottom down, and maybe even, like the album begins with bass melody, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eric created these melodies. Beautiful, beautiful. Eric is the best thing about the band. <laughs> <laughs> How much did he pay you? <laughs> did, did that right? Band come first? Right? No. Do you agree? <laughs> 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 so, so at one point, Tim, they're not liking how Tim's singing and whatever. I, I told you we worked for for a, few, for a couple of weeks, and uh, Tim was on his honeymoon, and at one particular point, they didn't like how you, I don't know what song it was, but they didn't like how you were sounding on one of the other song. I don't know what it was. And uh, Eric was like, they slamming doors and doing stuff. And tell him this, tell him that. And, and Eric put... Open says, tell him this, tell him that, tell him that, you know. I'm like, I think it sounded good. We're working hard. It's not easy. You know, it's hard to sing. Singing is the hardest thing. Everything else is like, whatever, you know. You can get it, get to over it. But singing, man, that's just what, that's just like, it's your voice. I mean, you're flat, you're sharp. What I mean, you're, it's pitchy. I love that. It's pitchy. Well, what does that mean? Am I flat? Am I sharp? I don't know. It's just pitchy. You know what I mean? It's not fair. It's totally not fair. It's not fair. You're, you're, you're this, you're that. What am I supposed to do? I'm just going to keep singing, you know? Like, oh, it's the hardest job. And these guys, are, for whatever reason, Eric didn't like you know, what was going on. And he says, tell him this, tell him that, tell him this, the other. And I'm like, I'm not going to tell him, you know? And it's like, I think he's doing great. You tell him. And Eric goes, okay, he comes in and he, he pushes the talk back button. Down I go, there's the talk back button. Pushes it and he goes, hey, dude. 
He goes, I don't want to bum you out or anything. <laughs> he goes, but the way you're singing, it's just gay and lame. <laughs> centrifugal force in the band, the making of the record, from my perspective, it's centrifugal force. It's like, like I talked about personalities, four different personalities pulling in different directions, and how to pull it together, how to pull it together, like every day to come back in and tell Andy that what he did the day before was good, because he always wants to redo it, you know? When he sang, when he sang Sunstone, this is before they... Before we had auto tune, now we have auto tune, and we know, we look, we move. Wait, tell it when Sunstone is. Save it for Sunstone? I'm gonna roll, I'll forget. Okay, I'll forget. I'm a little ADD. <laughs> I'm gonna forget. Just bring back. Me too. But I go in one day, and he has a his guitar tuner plugged into the patch board, figuring out, watching, looking at a guitar tuner, saying, see, see, I'm going sharp, I'm going flat. His vocal, way before autotune is ever thought of. I'm like, he's like, this is proving it. I'm sharp all the time. I'm like, Andy, you sound great. You know, that's because I, I was singing. I'm like, I could hear the pin. I'm like, I'm totally off. And then sounds great. Yeah, but I'm, I'm off. Doesn't matter. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, you got, you got. Oh, it doesn't matter. You guys, <laughs> sun, sunstone. He sounds great, right? Yeah. 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 Music. That was a great segue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, this is two very different things. This is Creole, which is a very mono, dirty song, and then it goes to Sky High, which is extremely hi-fi and stereophonic. And, you know, like they're and Sky High. Of course, we had to go back and re-record stuff, and that was like. This guy has one of them mixed at a big, awesome LA, you know, fancy pants studio and you know, all that stuff. But so these two are like a sharp difference in sound, but it's kind of cool that how they actually work together in this side view. The, putting them in on vinyl, there's only so much room. The grooves can only be so compressed on a vinyl, so you, you really can only get like 18 minutes per side. And when we were making this record, and back in that day, every CDs and everything were like super long because you could put a lot of time on CD. So when I looked at it, I'm like, I'm gonna put this on vinyl, and I figured out, like, oh gosh, we're gonna have to do four sides because this stuff won't fit. So because when they asked us to write more songs to were maybe a little more upbeat, we wrote a 10 minute song. So it's got to be. <laughs> The original version. Is it, is it 45 or 33? It's 33. It's the only way it would fit. This was the. There was an in between mastering of the record that included Shock and Loverboy and all that stuff, and it was really long. The album was super long. So this is the trimmed down version of the album. But on that version, I believe. Creole was track two instead of yeah. in this spot.
processing party that Jeremy wasn't there, but he's here now. He kind of called me out on that, on Sky High guitar solo, because up to that point, Mercury, the album, we were trying to avoid the R-O-C-K or R-A-W-K, as it might be. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of which comes from right here, so... Uh, you know, but Sky High, we sort of let it out a little bit, you know, they've just got those moments, and uh, he, he's like, hey man, the guitar solo is kind of Motley Crue, Home Sweet Home. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it probably is yeah, almost exactly that. Because I listen to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? Cool. That Thank solo you. in Sky High. What uh, about it? Oh. Which one? Anyways, any questions about? You, you know, like to the guitar solo aside, I, I hear a lot of the verbs like you storm in heaven. There. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Yes, absolutely. The verb are in almost precisely the same age as us. <laughs> We're like we. Ashcroft is a year younger than me. Yeah. Yeah. So like we were doing our bands at the same time. It's just they were doing stuff that we were listening to going like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't want to suggest it's derivative because I actually I hear more in the drums than in the instrumentation. The working title for that song was called Super the Bird. And the, it's a eight and nine minute song. That's those are all the best parts of a twenty minute jam that we caught on cassette. Like we played pretty much all those parts in this one super long jam. Yeah. And just that's the pared down version of like this great moment that happened in the rehearsal room. So that's what we call it super the because it's like a lot like the verb and it was super long. Thank you, Jim. Andy? Yeah. So uh oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> So, the, uh, you know, it's called Super the Verb because, you know, obviously we love the verb, and, but um, that out section, and, you know, I can't remember if there's another part or not, but um, it's based on Love and Rockets, Holiday on the Moon, the whole walk down, just like, so the whole out thing, you know, when, when Tim's like, you know, singing, it's just like, oh, just walking all the way down, you know, via... You know, F. So, uh, so it's not like super the verb. It's like mm -hmm. we really like to be the verb, but we kind of like. <laughs> well, okay, all right, whatever. But you know that you guys the love and rockets part in there, which I think has always been one of the difficulties and one of the assets about the band is we always come from different. We 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 carry our own baggage and our own bands that we like, you know. So like, we want to write a verse song, and then, but we really like this little rocket song, and we just sort of like just shove it together. Mm -hmm. It becomes you know you know the prayer chain. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's good or bad. You know, I don't know. So, yeah. and also if you notice on, uh, what's it called? Brilliant. Uh, there's. Like I hijacked the lyrics from a Love and Rockets song. That's why it says, you know, thanks to Love and Rockets, because you know, give me an hour, I'll show you how you feel. So that's where that's from. So, like, like when I'm sorry, I'm not to make it about myself. Uh, is that okay? Hey, you're the best thing in the bridge. <laughs> 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 It's just, you know, like super the verb and whatnot, like we all steal from people that we love and respect. So like, like Mercury, I have no idea where that came from. I have no idea where that baseline came from or how Andy wrote that or did that. Super the Verb is like inspired by the verb, but also it had like the love and rockets. And so like, 
I'm gonna be honest, like I steal all the time from from artists and people because they inspire me and you know and it gives me a direction. Because like sometimes you're like you're sitting there with an acoustic guitar or sitting in front of your keyboard or doing whatever, like I need to be inspired. Mm -hmm. You're just like there's nothing fucking in front of me. But you know what? I'm gonna play a Tears for Fears record and see what inspires me from there. And I'm gonna start writing from there, start doing something from there. Just, you know, like, just taking those, those things that when you're a kid and just like, God, it's so beautiful. How can I recreate that? So like, I don't think it's stealing, but it kind of is, but it, I think it's just like recreating that, that element that you want to share with other people. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, Steve, from a production, from a producer standpoint, you have a nine-minute song that not only is nine minutes but has almost several, two or three false endings almost. Was there ever a temptation from a, I hate to say a business standpoint, versus an art, art artistry standpoint to separate, either shorten it or separate it into three songs or two songs or I love this, I love this. Oh, what's your name my kids Jeremy it's gonna be good um, are you talking about uh, Sky High, High? Yeah. yeah the one song on the, the production that I did not produce <laughs> I did not produce that song um, uh, if you had yeah <laughs> if I had it would sound like it did I would have been like what the hell you know but um uh, it's interesting because I, I want to talk about two things at this at this point. Eric, Eric and I were talking about. I'm a little ADD, so I have to go. Uh, if I talk about the first thing, I'll forget about what the second is. But um, I want to, the second thing I want to talk about is the song "Lover Boy." This note on the album. You guys familiar with it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I want to say something about that because <laughs> there are two songs I produced that didn't get on the record. There were there was "Chalk," which I loved because yeah. Wayne wrote the lyric. It was up tempo and "Lover Boy." which I love, because they were the two up tempo songs. In my mind, that was the pacing. When they took those two songs off, I was like, oh my god, you took all the tempo off the record. You took the rock songs off. It's going to be boring. Wow, I can't believe you would do that, you know. But anyway, uh, that's one thing. But I want to talk about Lover Boy. But they, they um, for, what, for whatever reason, um, I don't know, because I, was, I, I made this record with them that included Chalk and... Lover Boy didn't have uh, Sky High on it, and uh, we were still talking about the sequence and the order of songs and all that when I was done with them, and Gene had mixed the record. And then I got busy, probably I was working in the, on another band or whatever, and found out, oh, there's still, the record company's not happy, you know, Kristen Sinkle, oh, surprise, you know. <laughs> uh, and so they're going to do something else. And then Sky High, what? You know, I mean, I don't know what you guys are doing, but just leave me out of it because I'm busy, you know. But um, it's, it was, it's been strange over the years to hear Sky High. Mm. And just now, once again, I'm back there, I'm walking around, I'm hearing this thing, and I'm going, it sounds incredible. I mean, yeah. it sounds, record without yeah, I mean, I'm like, oh my God, it sounds good. I'm just telling Eric, I'm going, oh my God, this sounds good. I'm just saying, I mean, how much money, where did you mix this? I mean, what did you guys do? I mean, like, and so I was a little bit like emotionally like, what, they didn't need me? Or what? <laughs> they're better without me? Or whatever, you know? But I, but so one, the one thought I have, I mean, it sounds beautiful. It's a beautiful song. I did not think the record needed another slow song. <laughs> and to get rid of the two fastest songs and add a slow song, I'm thinking, you're out of your mind in 1995, you know. Yeah. She, I mean, what, the record's not droning and slow enough? Oh my god. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, but um, it sounds incredible, but I just, I just said to Eric right now, what if you guys would have done another record? I mean, you're, basically, you're, you're at the top of your game. You've done... You know, a band gets to the point, you know, you, you, you're all in boot camp with the EP, and then you did Shawl, and you toured, and you did, you fought with Mercury, and did this crazy thing, and then you're just like, you guys are really good, and I'm hearing the drumming, and I'm going, oh my god, Wayne got good. 
This guy can't play to a clip, you know? <laughs> oh, he was so young. He was 19 years old, right? I mean, he was like, oh, my gosh, this guy can't even play, you know? And, but, you know, and then he came through, and we grew together. I fell in love with Wayne. as, as uh, It's well documented. I, mean, I fucking love Wayne, you know? And then he got good, and then I'm, like, here in the sky. I'm here. I mean, it's just like, it's this beautiful thing. I'm like, those guys are good. I, got, I just said, Eric, what if we'd have done another record right then? You guys quit in your why did you guys quit in your prime? You could you couldn't get along. You know, you know? what would have happened is we might have made something because about that time in our album life cycle, we the probably the next record we could have made would have been like your guys' circle slot. About the exactly. Same that's what I'm saying. Which, which we saw them play the choir came out to Orange County on the circle slide anniversary tour. Mm -hmm. It was are there any kids here? Album top to bottom, it was like unbelievable. So yeah, we might have maybe we would have made something. That's our close sixth to that. album, you know. You guys didn't. That was your sixth album. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I missed time. Yet. But anyway. Yeah. But you know, yeah. You guys are good. You guys got good. When you hear Sky High, you kind of hear the bread chain at the top of your game. I agree. New right? album. New album. <laughs> New album. It's never too late. There's still time. Do your circle slide. The thing about Sky High 2 is that it is, it is uniquely major key. It's, it's very just bright, cheery major key with a very earnest thing, and that was different than the whole rest of the record. It was not uh, posing and moping in the corner or whatever. Are we talking about Sky High? Wayne wrote the melody. Sky High. Which I wrote most of the melodies mm -hmm. for the bird chain and some of them just a couple I didn't, but that was one that Wayne did almost everything. Yeah, it was great. First off, I just want to say like I think it's perfect that you guys chose a house that had a whirlpool refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing I saw when I walked That's in. That's why, why Wayne chose, chose it. it right? yeah. Of course. So I was trying to get real meta. <laughs> 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 I just wanted to mention like the the ending to uh, to Sky High. I think it's one of my favorite endings to a song like ever. Um, but I was wondering about like why it was chosen to be like there. Uh, you mentioned you know several other points where naturally the song could have ended. Um, why there and why the choice to like go to distorted guitars? Like it's completely different than the rest of the song. Like what like what went into that? Didn't have a producer. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently that works sometimes. But... I've already paid Steve his three grand. He's out. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the if you read the story online, like we did what we if you look on our band camp, you see Hum, that version mm -hmm. of Mercury was, and that's the record we made with Steve, and that top to bottom, all mixed by Gene. And uh, so Chris, who was here earlier, came out. To meet with us at a Mexican restaurant and right by LAX and said, What's wrong with you guys? Or, Are you okay? Are you yeah, okay? are you okay? <laughs> and we all said, No. Yeah. I kind of trust that. So, uh, they wanted, you know, like, can you give us a little something, you know? So, Sky High and then Friend or Foe came out of that. Like, we had to write something that had a little more of a lift to it, you know? And we're all fans of bands from the 80s that do very bright major key stuff epically you know what I mean like that's kind of and so that's that's what that is we just the initial version of Mercury we just scrapped all of that influence like we just said we're gonna avoid that and do this other thing but we it snuck back in just sort of out of necessity you know, sort of. Did, did, did you did you guys realize what you had with Sky High, did you, did you realize it's going to be? It would become what it is nowadays. Like I said, it was an edited. That was like a twenty-minute song edited down. So it was like, I don't know. We just we tried to cram as much as we could in of all the good ideas that we liked from the rehearsal jam without making it too brutal and listening. And there was a little bit of the you know, the 
they wanted a like more like a single or whatever. I'm like here's an eight minute. Yeah. I don't think so. that was intentional though. Like that wasn't like the like, no, we just like we weren't trying to be like oh fuck you you know whatever. I think it was just more like that was the way that that song sort of developed. I mean it was we it was supposed we liked the, those long sort of jammy kind of verb songs and they you know kind of turned out that way. And so as we sort of started. Figuring out well, where do we go from here to here, it was just kind of like it just sort of got longer and longer and longer. <laughs> the more we jammed it, the more it got long, and we trimmed it up. How did you guys take like them not wanting like the version that you gave them? Like, did was it pretty emotional? Like, were you like, I don't want to write <coughs> more, or did you just have those songs like sitting there? Or? Uh, I think it was an uphill. It's a shocker. They didn't like this entire thing, and it's in, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's, you know, and of course, you know, we know what a hit sounds like, and we knew we didn't have something that really sounds a lot like a hit. So, but that was what we wanted to do. Yeah, I, I think we all realized at that point, you know, like when Chris, the guy that was here, just we flew back from Europe and he was at the airport just saying like, fellas, you gotta fix this. Now we sort of know, you know, we knew we were done. So we had a couple of options and I think we tried to do the best we could, but also like in the context of just like, we're still, we're still doing this record selfishly about us, not to like, you know, we're not gonna write another shine you know, just to make them happy. Like, we're gonna write whatever we wanna do and we're gonna make it as bitchin' as we can do. <laughs> and so that, I think that's what ended up happening. And, you know, we gave them the record, you know, they got sky high, which of course it's like, yeah, sweet man, you got eight minutes now, you know? And we lost some of the best songs. Like, I love Todd, I love Lover Boy. And you know, like it's like Loverboy is like a very big contention with me and Tim. But I love Loverboy. I just Oh god. It was fun. It was fun. No, wait, Dry. just let me finish. <laughs> we'll come back to this like in an hour from now. Like, yes, poke on my pants, wipe my nipples, whatever. <laughs> always um, about Sky High is I know the fans love it for me it was n I never enjoyed playing it and but there's like a ton of great elements and it's you know I'm stoked I think the better song is actually friend or foe that came out of that same session <laughs> so I'm just saying like I know Sky High is, is rock and roll and like, you know, shit happens and fireworks are going off and you know, people are like, woo! You know? <laughs> but I think the better song is actually, you know, Friend of Pro. So for whatever that's worth, that's that's my two cents on like when reunion said like, fellas, gotta write a single. Okay, you got like this six minute song of do 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 or you got an eight minute song of boom. And incidentally, friend or foe could have just as easily been titled uh, Super the Stereo Lab. Okay. Yes. <laughs> but it was not. It was not. It was not one of the titles. Yeah. So, so is that how, is that kind of how Antarctica was birthed? What do you mean? Like the, the extra songs that had to be made, or the yeah, ones yeah. that were originally conceived? Yeah, yeah, all, the, all that stuff on Antarctica were, was part of, I guess, like, the Mercury era. Not necessarily considered for the record, but they were recorded, you know, properly. And then they were banished to Antarctica. <laughs> and they were banished to Antarctica with, you know, the, you know, the one penguin, one foot, just 
fucking right. Well, the song <laughs> itself was initially that was us. Yeah, no jokes. Yeah. We were kind of Guess saying, <laughs> I like it. If we need to have a rock tune, here you go. And we, you know, Antarctica was kind of like had the that drive to it stuff, but. Like when you listen through, if you listen through Hum, that version of the record, and you hear like, it's a grind in Antarctica, like when it comes in, it just feels like, ugh, and all those songs in a row, very, they grind you down by the end of that and stuff. So, um, I think that's kind of why it was banished, because that's one of the, we were talking about the last listening party, there's three or four songs where you can hear Steve counting in on the little microphone, and uh, that's one of them, the beginning of Antarctica, to count in on the beginning of Creole. And then Grilly, I didn't hear him count right because he's in the room with Wayne or something like that. I don't know. It's like you, you hear these points. I'm also not the too. best at math. I don't know anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I know I was part of Antarctica and yeah, it was in LA, two. but I do not remember what I did or what I can't tell. You that's recorded a lot of that hey. mixing lab beat. Right. Hey, grab me that guitar real fast. Please, anyway. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna play a quick song so you guys can understand how Antarctica happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Live music. You can it it this is a Nashville exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows what Eric's gonna do right now. Whose guitar is this? Steve. <laughs> So pretend that's an amp that's on full blast. So we're gonna do an Antarctica guitars. You guys ready? This is Andy. Is that good? Okay, one more time, okay. Studio and Andy's just sitting there with like this tiny little amp with his guitar with a couple pedals just going trying to like get the perfect scream. scream. And I'm just like, dude, just let it scream. But no, he's working. spent on getting feedback for Antarctica was just impressive and probably terrible for his head and his impressive and defensive. Yeah. <laughs> I will follow that up with saying that it was so humorous when he was dissing the guitar tones because he's the guy, even before we signed a record deal, we were writing songs, he would literally sit in the living room of his house doing exactly what Eric said yeah. with his digital pedal board that was kind of cheap and crappy and didn't compare with these $10,000 pedal boards that the Violet Bay had. <laughs> but Andy would sit there for eight hours a day just fine-tuning tone and doing this for eight hours with his head one foot away from his speaker cabinet yeah. to get the perfect tones for our songs. And like, I've never known anybody that would do that. Yeah. Any good question. Yeah. Yeah. Best thing about the prayer chain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to say one thing about Lover Boy before we move on, because not on this record, but the whole thing about those songs that were sacrificed, in my mind, sacrificed. So I like those, those two tunes a lot. But Lover Boy was a fun one because Tim came off his uh, his honeymoon, and, and Tim had written with, and Tim wrote most of the lyrics for the, the or a lot of the records for Shaw Ride and Fork, 
But pretty much, no, Eric, no, Eric, no, Eric no. for Shaw. Mm-hmm. Whatever, but but it was one attempt. I always champion like all the guys, like Chalk, Eric. I mean, uh, Wayne wrote the lyrics to Chalk, so I was all in favor of that. And and Tim had written Lover Boy, and I was being a real dick because I called it Lover Boy uh, because it was what, what was your original title? It was something, but you were seriously, seriously mad. He loved with his wife, whatever. It was a very serious title. Yeah, Yeah. and I'm like, and the other guys were like, they didn't really like it or whatever. I don't know what there was tension about it. And I we just just didn't like him. Yeah, (laughs) it (laughs) it has nothing to do with anything other than right. So I named it Lover Boy, and I wrote it. I wrote it right on the two inch tape. You know, used to have the two inch tape. You know, sitting there in in felt pen, you'd write the names. I mean, I wrote Lover Boy. And that wasn't the title, but I was just kind of being a dick to him, you know. And, and I thought the guys thought it was funny, right? Yeah. Uh, but, I, <laughs> but I secretly, I did like the song, and I felt that the album desperately needed some pop sensibility. God knows, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's nothing else happening. These guys are like, let's just ruin ourselves. Let's just all jump in a raft, stick a band in it, and sing as a Turkey Meyer. Yeah. No, I'm missing death. Yeah. <laughs> God knows. I'm with the record company and everybody, and like, I'm like, gosh, you know, we need a little lover boy. We need a little pop, you know. So I like it, you know, but I, and we had this great moment where we lined up cars outside. We were on, on Fifth Avenue South, not very far from here, like 10 minutes from here. And bad, the street where the studio was, was a, we didn't know, but it was like a, we just had moved here. We bought, we, we rented this space in this area that turned out to, we didn't know it was the male prostitution street. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know, you know, why we got it so cheap, you know. Like, at lunchtime, I'd go out, you know, I'd go out and walk down the street to go to the lunch place, and then some guy would slow down beside me. I'd be like, no, I'm just going to lunch. <laughs> You know, so we, we only were there for very long because they would also bust the windows. It's a bad place to be. You know, windows busted, stereo stolen. I'm sorry, you know, where our studio is. You know. But anyway, what am I saying? Oh yeah. So we lined up cars. One night, one night we we lined up cars late at night. Remember that? Yeah. And somebody got a hold of a handheld battery. It was like battery. one o'clock in the morning too. Or something. What time? It was very late. It was like one o'clock in the morning. Oh, it was like one o'clock in the morning. Yes. And we had a microphone that was like one of those battery-operated microphones. Somebody got a hold of it, right? And we went out and we could record it, and then somehow it like horns made it. What? Sorry, ruining your story. I said horns. Yeah. Shut it. Yeah, the horn, the car horns. We had the car horns. The cars lined up, and we wanted, you know, some, there was some lyric about the city, or I don't remember what it was. You're traveling in Europe with your wife, or something. I, I forget about the lyric. Yeah, anyway, we're working. Right? I'm like, oh, let's get horns. Let's get let's get the cars lined up. So we got four horns. At night, we're like, you know, and we don't care. I'm just like, so we got people to lay on their horns. <laughs> just like, all, everybody's laid on their horns, right? Yeah. And we got this the total time. I'm like, yeah, if somebody was out there, was cool. there like yeah. it was probably yeah. Wayne was out there, like just going moving across, you know, record it. But somehow it went to the tape. I don't understand the technology. Wayne, Wayne goes, go, go. <laughs> and we moved. And so I get the stereo. It was moving across the speakers, you know, because it was not digital. I and mean, it was just like really like. No, he had a mic in front of the car. The most amazing technology, yeah. oh my god. <laughs> moving from left to right, and it's going between, and the guys in the studio, like listening to it move across the speakers. You know? It's so amazing, right? You know, and it's so, so good, like, let's do it again! You know? <laughs> Put one left and one right, and I don't know what's going on. We did that, that was like wonderful, right? Killed Colbert's battery. His no, 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 we had one take because, like, you're like, let's do it again, that was great! And, like, every car's like, Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was it. We need to jump it. We need to jump the cable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, yeah, but it was so like uh, amazing. And then the other thing was that um, then you know Wayne, like we had this 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 two tracks of, of Wayne doing what we call Frenchie. Yeah. And Wayne stood out there, further making fun of Tim. <laughs> you know, and he's doing he does he he. Wayne, but talk French, Wayne. Talk French. <laughs> no, I was just talking about him being a lover boy. No, I want to hear you talk French right now. Il aime ta femme, 
Elle aime son bien <rire> salillon. And like the whole song, he does that, and then we go do another pass, you know. So he does two passes of doing that that pseudo French, holding a glass of wine, a cigarette, <laughs> making you know just fucking with Tim, really. Yeah. And then and we put it left and right, and we're just so happy. So every time, and the song was a good track, but every time we would listen to it or whatever, because yeah. it was all on two on a on a on board on a console, you know. So you can't. It was called Frenchie, and it was two tracks. So any guy could walk up to the faders and just push them up. <laughs> and then you'd hear nothing but two tracks, a fling, a pan left, a pan right, talking French. <laughs> and that's what happened every time we listened to it. Tim was, do you remember it at all? No. <laughs> You're a liar. You're a liar. You're a liar. You're a liar. Whatever. So, Every time we listen to it, somebody, probably Eric most often, would reach over there and like push up Frenchie, you know. So all we could hear was Wayne, you know, sweetie, do just whatever, you know. <laughs> so anyway, come to the end of it all. We're at Jeans uh, in the green room, Jeannie Jeans. We, we're like a week there and, uh, and mixing it. And uh, we were proving all the mixes. Now remember, in, the, in these days, we, What's so funny, Eric? <laughs> I know where this story's going. So, yeah. <laughs> so mixes, when a mix was put down, it was put down because you couldn't recall it. wasn't automated. Like now, you know, three days later, a week later, three weeks later, an our guy calls you goes, hey, you know, turn up the vocal. Or how about if there's a shaker or the tambourine? Or when they tell you stuff. And you can go, all right, we got to recall it. And back then, no. You know, you had to put down, it took a lot of guys to do a mix. Because you had the, everything was manual and you're pushing faders and the guy would run around the back of the console and unmute, you know, it took, like, it took about four or six guys, you know, to yeah. get a mix, you know, on the console working it and you'd be all kind of sweaty after it. You'd be like, how was your, how are your moves? You know, listen back and you're like, oh, I missed the thing or I didn't push up the whatever. My responsibility was, you know. Whatever, you know, mixing was a lot more different thing. And then it was done. It's like if the A and R guy, Chris Smith, wanted to be there for a reunion, yeah. he needed to get there at three in the afternoon or one a.m. Whatever time that song was going down, because you're trying to get a song in a half a day, so it could be any time, right? If you're trying to mix a twelve album, twelve song album in a week, you know, or a ten song album in a week, you're going to do, be doing a song in a half. You know what I mean? You got to get it done. So what's going down? You got to be here. If you're not there, you're gone. Yeah. So have your say. Yeah. We're doing it now. And then after that song's done, you all agree on it, you zero the board, you cool the faders down, it's over. That yeah. song is on the album, how it is. Yeah. There's no second guessing. Yeah. Make the decision now. Love it. You know. So, you know, you go through the door. But anyway, so so we're doing so Tim was there. Tim's there and you we I think it was like toward the end, for some reason you had to go. No, you couldn't stay. And you were so concerned about Loverboy because it was it was your song. You cared a lot about it. It was really great. And but you were annoyed because Fritzy was always so loud, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you kept pushing up the You try to be cool. You try to be cool. You try to be cool about it. I, I do remember. I remember. Yeah, you try to be cool about it. it. Ha ha ha. Uh, okay, you guys want to call it Loverboy. So. You don't want to title the song Loverboy. Ha ha. That's cool. Whatever. Yeah. You know? He's being cool with it. Um, but right at the end, uh, he has to go, and he says, I'm there, and he says, hey, Steve, he goes, man, you've done a great job, I just, he goes, I just, he goes, I just want to bro you a little bit, and he hands me two 20s. <laughs> and this, <laughs> I go, oh, man, I go, thanks, man, he goes, yeah, you've been so great, and I grab the 20. And you hold on to it. I'm pulling it up. <laughs> he, looks, he looks me straight in the eye and he goes, Keep Frenchie low in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I said, Okay. And it works. It is very low in the mix. I mean, you know, hey, we all have our price, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I shouldn't have been up in the first place. <laughs> no, I, I love so I just made you 40 bucks. <laughs> no, that's it. So what do we have coming up next? Uh, the Verve Storm in Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, 
know, Lover Boy's a great jam. I, I wish. We are going to. I remember to playing it like a. Uh, remember playing it like Louisville too. Two times. I, I know. Okay. Let's play right, chalk. <laughs> 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 Here. What? Oh, thank you. It's important. Um. So this is where the record kind of divides in half, and sonically, the whole back half takes on the more percussion oriented <coughs> angle. So these two songs oh. are. Truly fine versions of that. The first song was <laughs> the first song. The drum track was just a percussion track. Was Steve and Wayne sitting there facing each other in the room, playing parts and just playing off of each other, and like that's the that's the drum track. Is those two guys just playing percussion, and they had a way of working together that at that point was. And today they might call it a little bit of a bromance, <laughs> at least yeah. as far as percussion is concerned. Like it was, it was deep to them, and it was like a huge spiritual level thing of percussion. Awesome. Broke, broke back prayer chain. Yeah. Well, you, I mean. <laughs> <laughs>
that was maybe our favorite song on the record in mm. many ways. Um, it just has like, there's so much that's kind of, uh, we just really liked it. And, um, <laughs> so I was, I was, <laughs> Steve from around the corner, yeah! <laughs> So, the what, what's the, the story with the snare? Steve, uh, well, you tell the story because you know all the details better than I do. No, I don't remember any of it. With the <laughs> snare? No, I don't remember anything about it. You guys said well, like something, you just pulled it out of Well, it was one of your snares, and you had, you, we, uh, we had been looking for something. So, a lot of the songs started as, um, you know, when we were writing them in the, in the room, was like, you know, a lot of percussion, um, you know, starting on a groove, and then we'd sort of figure out a song, right? And then, um, so um, what we would do is we'd, we'd build the song around the, the, the percussion pattern, and then we'd add things, and then we did the same thing in the studio. You know, we'd, we'd start with um, with percussion, and then or, or a basic percussion, and then we'd you know do the song, and then maybe we would add some more things at the end and stuff. So you know, at the end of the you know recording process, you're always like looking for ways to you know fill a hole that needs to be filled, or just sort of you know add a little touch of something, a little flavor somewhere, and so. Um, so, uh, so I don't know if I don't know if we came up with the idea, but you know, one of us said, "Well, let's you know, we need to bring in like the backbeat. We need to do like a kick and snare, like just to kind of like take that you know thing at the end and just make it like really go kind of to a different place." So, Steve um, had pulled a, I think a couple of snares because we would play different snares, you know, for different tracks, I believe, because you know you just want like a different sound, you just kind of get sick of the same sound on every song. So. Um, he pulled the snare out, and so we're like, okay, yeah. And Chris Colbert like mic'd it up and everything, and so we just, you know, we kind of hit it a couple times. Yes, yeah, sounds great, whatever. And then, um, you know, and it was just, it was very kind of loosey goosey, if I remember it correctly. And it was just sort of like, you know, uh, Chris just sort of stuck the microphone in the room somewhere, and just like, all right, here we go, you know, and you know, press this record, and then it was like, boom, and it's a like, pop. And then when we came and listened to it back, we went like, holy. Fuck. This is just like this. You just get all like the the snares. You can hear them buzzing underneath the thing, but then you also get the top. And I don't know. As you know, sorry to geek out on the drum thing, but it's like you know, for drums, a lot of times you know, there's a big challenge with the tuning and the, how they sound and stuff. And so, you know, we had done all these other tracks with different drums, and this one was just like the snare just sounded so good, and it was just like a really beautiful sound. And so we, so we every time we hear it, it was just kind of like. Yes, the sound, man. There's that sound. It's so awesome. So, uh, yeah, so that's the, the snare story. But I remember uh, Tim said with, that we, we went out and bought some percussion. That was actually on the Shawl record when we, you and I went out. And we, I, I knew about this import store in Pasadena. Yeah. And we went and bought some things. Um, and, and one of them was this one. And I, I, this is one of my favorite things I've ever had. And when I think of the prayer chain, I think of this thing. It's made in Pakistan. I love Middle Eastern percussion more than like South American. I like Middle Eastern and African for some reason. I've lost a lot. It used to be all, it's busted up, you know, because I've been using it for all these years. But, um, you know, when you hear, ay, 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 when Shine is Dead or whatever, you know, you hear, Wing. this thing, it's like a big sound of the, of the prayer chain to me, this particular instrument. Like that one, I, we just heard again. You came up, right? I saw you go up and you go, is this it? Is this? Yeah. Yeah, I hear this a lot of times on the, on the prayer chain. I think of this, you know, it's just so tribal, you know, or whatever. It's, you know, and I, one thing I love about uh, percussion is that you visualize, I don't know what people visualize, because when you hear a drum kit, you, you, you see a hi-hat, you see a kick drum, you see a snare when you guys playing a guitar, you visualize a six-string guitar, four-string bass, everything is just so formulaic. Rock and roll is just so formulaic. Everybody has the same exact drum kit that Ringo Starr had. You know, not another thought. The snare is 14 inches. The toms are 12 and 16. You know, the cymbal is 20 inches. Two, you know what I mean? The, cymbal, the cymbals are 14 inches. It's so formulaic. Mm -hmm. And with percussion, though, it's completely, it's not, it's not objective, it's subjective. It's completely open your mind to whatever. And when people hear the sounds, they must visualize something. Everyone that hears it has to visualize something different. Yeah, and you will never, is. nobody ever visualized this right. yeah. <clears throat> when they heard it. You know, but some guy, you know, with a turban on his head, you know, painted these lines, sitting cross-legged, you know what I mean? And there's yeah. love into this instrument. You know, this is Middle Eastern brass, you know, I just love this stuff. And it's also contextual, because it's like, 
you know, some of these rhythms for some of these songs are very, very standard rhythms in like in African drumming and Middle Eastern drum, uh, percussion. You know, very standard rhythms, or even like the sound like a djembe, like on uh, like on bendy line that we'll hear, um, or on uh, on shiver just before. You know, a djembe is a very it's like a drum kit, so you, your standard drum kit. You know, it's the same thing. It's a standard beat and everything, but it's in a different context than like you know a rock song or rock band or whatever. And then the same thing happens with this particular um, instrument, you know, this thing comes on top of, you know, in a rock song and it changes that dynamic too. And then like when you have a song like Shiver that was in this sort of very much kind of like a, um, you know, uh, very much like an African sort of, you know, uh, percussive kind of groove. And then all of a sudden you bring in like a, a conventional kick and a snare just to bring it back into like the Western sort of rock thing. It's just, it's kind of like a, a way to sort of make the song feel a little bit like it's not going somewhere where it was you know, predictable. And then what's the other thing? Is it a doom that that's one of the other main doom yeah. things that have like a tambourine inside of it? Yeah. yeah. That thing was kind of... I got that in my car. I got a lot of stuff in my car I'm going to probably bring out later on if, if something goes on, if people start hitting stuff. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I'm open. I got some stuff in my car. <laughs> We have to make it through the record too. Yeah, I want to say one more thing. This is the last site, right? Last site. You can say whatever. I just want to say one more thing. The very last song, Sunstone, my favorite uh, sonic thing on this record, and probably, dare I say, any record. I mean, it's way up there. Okay. The fifteenth bar of Sunstone. When we're sitting, when we're, Andy's singing the bar, right? We're sitting uh, not far from here. <coughs> And it's it's hot. You say it was up July, so I, I believe it was. But it was hot. Remember, it was like shirts off, everybody. Shirts off, everybody. You know, and because we didn't have air conditioning in that place, and it was summer, and we all were sitting there in the control room. Um, we did all the vocals in the control room. I like doing stuff in the control room as much as possible. We're all together, and we all had headphones. We had like six headphones, and we we're in a circle, and Andy was singing, um, Sunstone. And it was raining outside, and so you hear thunder and rain, and we had the doors open. You hear the cars driving by, and I love the sound of that, so I told the engineer, stick a microphone outside. You know? So we had the microphone outside, uh, stereo, two microphones out there recording the cars driving by and the thunder and all that stuff, because it was so incredible when Andy was singing it. Wanted people to hear what we were hearing, and um, um, Andy sang so quiet. <laughs> you know, so the microphone is cranked, you know, the microphone is cranked at U47, so you can't even tap, if you tap your foot, the meter goes wham, you know, into the red, wham, don't even breathe, anybody. <laughs> so I'm so quiet, you know, not even trying to breathe, and Wayne has Rolling Rock beer, we're all, you know, whatever, I, I, I remember essentially it was Rolling Rock, and at one point, Wayne, like, pops the beer, and the cat falls up against the ground, <laughs> And it's louder than Andy's voice. It's, just, <laughs> it's so beautiful. It's in the 15th bar. And I'm like, oh, whatever you do. And we might have done another vocal take or two. I don't know. But back then, you can't save anything. I mean, you can't. You have to, like, erase around. Like, go out of record, go into record. You know what I mean? Like, don't. I tell the engineer, I don't know if it was Sky or, or, or Chris Colbert or whatever. I'm like, do not burn that. Yeah. And he did do a couple of So my, yeah. what I remember of that was, um, so... Uh, you know, we're all in the control room and we've all got headphones on and stuff And so I went to go get a beer and I come back and I come in and everybody's just kind of like this, you know, like And I'm like, oh, they must be listening back. Yeah. You know what I mean? They must be listening to that last take that Andy did, you know, so I'm just like mm -hmm. And then everybody's just like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And Andy comes in You know, and everybody's looking at me like what the <laughs> it's a beer. Because it's a 15 bar, and he's saying yeah. after 16 bucks, so it was like you had four beats. You know, click, 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 click. Just, it just coincidentally lands on the two on that bar. On that bar, right. I think it's like one. It's, it's, or it's like a pop, bink, and land on the floor. I think it's two. Really? Yeah, I think so. He opens his beer in rhythm. Let's mention in the same song the other thing is the uh, there was a thunderstorm going on. Yeah. And so Steve's like, get a mic out the front door and 
we put a mic out the front door and just recorded rain and thunder, and it happens to land at a very good time in the mm -hmm. song. Yeah. We did not place it. It I just, totally it that just that happened at those no. moments where like, it worked out in the song. Did not move it. That's how it was. That's how it felt. That's awesome. Weird, man. And that was the yeah. next time that we were all with the headphones, I just went like... <laughs> <laughs> So, so those two tracks, um, Andrew and I, were, when, when we were driving here, I was like, you know, one of the questions I want to ask them is about the space theme. You know, Yuri Gargan. Like, what, what's going on there? That's a cute like, question, man. Yeah, Eric, yeah, Eric what's going on? What? Yuri Gagarin. Yuri Gargan. Like, what's going on with the space theme in the lyrics? Well, okay. So Maybe you don't answer that. I feel awkward. You are. <laughs> this is terrible. Uh, I feel pretty. Uh, so when we started working <laughs> on, on Mercury, Andy was sort of like the driver of the themes. So what we did was sort of just take his themes and sort of start writing writing, you know, the lyrics. And it's, it was a bad time for Wayne, which was a great time for the production because he was squatting on the house. So me and him were able to, you know, work together and write lyrics with, you know, Andy at the same time. So the whole, the whole theme of the record is basically just distance and just being alone and just, just, just basically done, you know, like, there's there's no recovery. You just it is what it is, you know, and that's it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's 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 no really big like this, you know, strong theme of anything other than just like, you know, fuck it, I'm done. You know, this mm -hmm. is this is the record. We're making the record for a reunion. We know that they're gonna drop us right when it's done. So, yes. and this is what we what we want to say. Just like. Where we feel ostracized, we can't fix anything, we can't, you know, recover anything. So, like, you know, that's why it's, you know, like, I'm surprised Reunion didn't bust my balls on, like, uh, Creole, like, you know, like, slow gay. Because, you know, because Wayne, back in the day, everything was like, God, man, that's so gay. <laughs> Which I regret now. <laughs> no, you don't have to regret it, but it was like... There's you know, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. When we were in junior high, that was a, a word that was thrown yeah. around as yeah. a phrase. It just meant that's dumb. So that's, yeah. that, that's why, like, you know, like, Creole is like, everything is gay. Everything is gay. Everything is gay. Everything is gay. Nothing changes, you know? And that's even like, uh... Uh, so... Let's see this um, Mercury, um, all your feelings are streaming down your leg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, just everything is just lost. You just, you have nothing. This mm -hmm. is what you got. Yeah. And you have to deal with it. So. Hmm. All right. And we awesome. used we used space, I think, to sort of give it a I don't know, I can't think of the right word, but an image, sort of the coldness and isolation of deep space would be like that. It's the feeling. So. But there's something going on in your guys' imagination. I, I didn't hear the Mer Mercurius CD until yesterday, actually. Because I'd heard the Antarctica tracks, right? But I had never heard the Mercurius. And there's that, all the interview stuff, you know, like, which Star Wars character? Yeah, it's, it's including Andrew. Credits Andrew. But, like, which Star Wars character would be? I mean, is that simply, like, your guys' way of kind of creating humor from your situation? Okay, so here's the thing. As much as the prayer chain ever did anything that was uh, to be taken seriously and in earnest, uh -huh. it is double-handed with total taking the piss, like just okay. being fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. I was explaining to somebody outside, we were talking about it, right here, and uh, 
the alien picture that was like in the artwork, like that was a joke for us. We sat around a table one time talking about if aliens were coming to take over the planet and they ran like a friendly propaganda campaign beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> and like distributed t-shirts and stuff. And we came up with all these one-liners, but one of them was just like the alien face, like real just, you know, and just said, see you soon. Like, I'm gonna get you, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. We told Jason, the guy that did the artwork, and he like put it in the artwork. And we're just like, I can't, I can't get away with that, you know. Like, that. So it's a lot of jokes like that. And Eric and I were reading a lot of uh, books about all that stuff. Would be, uh, you know, just a, a theme that we thought about. All of it's intertwined. So it's like half funny and okay. half truly. Sometimes stuff is just funny for us, yeah, and then yeah. we assign it a serious meaning after that. Yeah. Like, Wait a minute. It was serious after all. <laughs> Which makes things real clear yeah. of for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> are they trying to be funny or are they not? Yeah. What? We don't know. <laughs> so where did the Jeffrey thing come from? The answering machine thing? Oh yeah. Oh god. I mean, is that so, an actual? Wait, can that I go was, back? That's can I go back to Alien really quick and say that? Alien Under the CD got us banned from some kind of Christian bookstore. <laughs> oh, and that's our, my response was, I don't know if they're Christian or not. Right. And it might be a big mission. You <laughs> 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 never yeah. know. Yeah, that's right, man. But they still pull our CDs off the shelves. There's some books right. that would wow. Is, it, is that why it was why I, Mine came with a black tray. Was it meant to be clear? Oh, or was that well, European? I, we've not seen those. Oh. Is that your hand? Press Maybe it could have been a different pressing. Yeah, my, mine was black too, and you had to remove the thing. Yeah, I'm like, what? Alien. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The alien was in the tray. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't on the actual art. It was like in the tray below the CD. It was in the tray. No, mine was black too. I oh, oh, I found a oh, secret. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Did Did you know know see that's what we had. But I, like, I live in the yeah, South, so, you know, it could be... Uh, yeah, the record company, unbeknownst to yeah. us, like, when they went to sell us CDs to sell the shows, like, give them the clear trays. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. The bookstore's like, we need the great right. trays. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, Jeffrey was, um, uh, so, my parents owned a condo, and so Jeffrey was the tenant in that condo. And I have a feeling that my parents were not very good at being landlords at the time, and so Jeffrey was the tenant, and he was a very weird dude. He was he was very, very strange. He asked my mother out on a date, and just some weird stuff, you know. Very odd guy. No, no, she was not. According to her, she, he was not an attractive man at all. And so, um, he's out of so, yeah, yeah, he was a he was a weird guy. Anyway, he was um, according to them, he was not a great tenant either. So maybe it was kind of both. But he but he left that series of answering machine messages, and I played it for these guys because I just thought it was just hilarious because <laughs> there's just this long string of Don. This is Jeffrey. Um, I've come home and none of my lights work. I gotta you gotta come over here and you know take you gotta fix all this. You know, and he just went on and on. Yeah. He like didn't really know how to operate the house lighting, so it was like I think you you told your dad just kind of went over and like. Flip the breaker. Like, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 it was. Yeah, that was his story. He was like, well, he, you know, his lights didn't work, and he didn't know where the breaker box was. So I went over and I flipped the switch, and uh, that was that. I didn't this, this whole, the, it's a series of messages that behind a cassette that were just. It was. It went it, comedy. I wish I could have the whole thing in there because so it was just like it was a really long and you know, but it, you know, it was too long to have a record. This is yes. my eighth call now. <laughs> Did you have to get his permission to use it? Uh, what's that? Did you have to get his permission to use it or not? <laughs> I don't think we got. Uh, I don't think we have permission from yeah. Evil Knievel either. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we have permission from his vinyl. Either. I don't think we have permission from his vinyl either. <laughs> Any other Mercury shiver? I'll say that Mercury is one of my favorite Prairie Chain songs. This is Jason Martin's actual favorite. Song. Yeah. And one of the signature pieces of the song is that Chris Colbert engineer purchased a little brown plastic microphone at a garage sale. And I'm not really sure how he got it to work with the system. It might have had to been wired or something. But when you hear that vocal tone that's kind of distorted and stuff that wasn't really tweaked out with outboard gear that was this crappy RCA brown mic shaped like a shell yeah uh, probably out of the 40s or 50s mm. yeah. Yeah, he got it for really... 25 bucks yeah yeah so that's that 
that's a fun piece for me because it really perfectly captured what that vocal should be like from mm -hmm. like a tone perspective. And it was just, again, like, mm -hmm. hey, why don't you try this microphone? <coughs> and it's just like, perfect. So I, my, my opinion on that song too, I, that's one of my favorites, but I always thought that just as a listener, it doesn't sound like, oh, I deliberately want to make the voice sound kind of, you know, squelch and distorted. It actually sounds like it's an appropriate little band of narrative like floating in that song, yeah. like like a like a cloud sort of it's not sitting in the sky. Yeah, it's just like yeah, it sounds natural in that song. To me. Yes, sir. Um the I'm I'm probably gonna regret saying this, it's, it's super cheesy. But uh <laughs> I was, uh, let's say, getting ready to finish high school when this came out, and uh, I was at Cincinnati area. It's super conservative. I went to a church that necessarily was, um, I didn't feel like I felt with, or like, I, I didn't feel like I belonged within Christendom, things like that. And so, um, Mercury was huge for me, but those two songs in particular, for me, they were amazing because... I had always felt like you could be both like good and bad and you you know you could be more than what Christianity wanted you like the 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 view of Christianity that I had was not the view I wanted to be a part of I guess and so uh these two songs for me they they were amazing it's almost like uh the choir's got a new CD and they they got the uh Whole lot better, whole lot worse than what you think I am song. I forget what it's actually called, but um, that's it. That's it. Yeah. So, so, but it, it was that idea portrayed within these two songs. Like, look, you know, to get this bad, it takes years. But to get this good, it, it takes years as well. And so, it just, it almost gave me permission to um, uh, be myself and figure out that that part of it. You know what I mean? Like, it, it was just a really awkward time because I was 17, 18, I had my own thoughts. Um, they were against what I knew from my environment, you know, but at the same time, I was trying to think about things, come up with my own identity, and these two songs for that period was huge, just with, with my spiritual development and things like that. And I know that's horrible to say. It's, I'm not saying it was your responsibility or anything like that. But, <laughs> but, but, yeah, but, it's the opposite of horrible. Yeah. yeah but, but but what I mean by that was like it was really for for a child of of that age, it was huge to me. And it was those two songs, you know, as you go through the journey of Mercury, it, that was almost like a turning point. Like, look, it is bad, but it's but it's 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 fine, you know. And then you end on the high note of sort of like a yeah. a spiritual thing. So. so I'll tell you, man, oftentimes we would joke that, like, who was the prayer chain for? And at the time, we were very current with, or, you know, people also doing music at the time was band, maybe like DC Talk or Audio Adrenaline, whatever. So uh, picture a youth group, and there's, you know, 50 kids, and... All of them are listening to DC Talk and Audio Adrenaline, and there's one kid in the back that's kind of like this. <laughs> yeah, he likes the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> Where's that guy? Yeah, there's that person just kind of like, you know, and that was we would be like, we don't have the fan, the number of fans that those bands had. We'd always play the side stage; they play the main stage. We knew those guys; we talked to them and stuff. But you know, we definitely hit that target of the person who was trying to like, just exactly what you described, that's who, where yeah. are you? You know what I mean, like, we're, we're the same, so. And your record label did a promotional interview thing for um, for Mercury, and Eric said something pretty close to that at that that time, and it was awesome. I was like high-fiving him in my computer screen. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. we would get, you know, this is the day before the internet. It was like we would get letters from people, and they would say things like, "They'd say, yeah. this is what you guys meant to me." And I was like, "That's incredible." But so it was, yeah. Sometimes it's more it's more important to so deep than it is to so wide, mm -hmm. and this is evidence of sowing deep. Mm -hmm. Twenty years. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, I, I'm gonna tell a gratuitous story. Okay. 
Sorry, yeah. Okay, so in... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got yes, you know, but some folks are going a long way. So... I only know. In 2010, I was on a tour. I played guitar in One Republic for a month. Because <laughs> uh, their guitarist was having a kid, and I had worked on their album in 2009. And uh, the drummer of that band was a guy that came to see the prayer chain play and was in the violet burning and like he's a friend you know so he got me in their gig and stuff so like i'm sitting there and the singer guy uh in at every stop he's always booking studio time and working on songs he's never stops so we're in london and he's like man i got a studio session you want to come i'm like yeah so we're sitting in a car he's talking to one of his friends from college he went to the Oral Roberts in Tulsa. Whoa. Are you? Yeah. Whoa. Ryan Tedder went to Oral Roberts. That's where I went. I know him. And he goes, Yeah, I went. I know Ryan. So he's talking to a buddy from college, and uh, his friend is like, I'm sitting there with a guy who is one of the top songwriters in the world at that point. You know, he's like, you know, writing for yeah. Beyonce and all that stuff, in addition to the band being a big band. And he's on his phone with his friend. And he's like, Yeah, I'm just, I'm cruising a car going to see him with, with Andy. Yeah, Andy Cricket. Yeah, Andy Cricket from the prayer chain. <laughs> so he, looks at, he kind of looks at me and talks, I'm like, <laughs> so this guy that is his friend went to school was, he knows Brian, so he's just like, yeah, you're Ryan, you know, you're a guy in school. And I'm sitting there with Ryan, and I'm like, dude, you're killing it, you're awesome, you know, and stuff. But his friend is like, you're with Andy Cricket from the prayer chain. And that's the yeah, thing, yeah. the prayer chain had that effect on people that yeah. it seems to be very, it's deep instead of, you know, yeah. why. But, that's kind of, that's because I think we, like I said, were you. We were those people in our own situations mm -hmm. looking for bands and music that were doing the same kind of thing. So it was like, and then shiver when you take responsibility. It's, it's beautiful. It, the devil, no, no, it's me. You know, it's me. That's, that part's yeah. awesome. It's yeah. amazing. I was, I was telling, I was, I was telling Tim earlier, I was actually a DJ at ORU's radio station. And, um. When we we were playing mostly like DC talk kind of stuff and maybe some code of ethics mixed in just because you know it was kind of it was kind of big at the time you know and uh, some audio adrenaline and then uh, we started playing stuff off of Whirlpool and honestly uh, we would get like people requesting us play those songs all the time and we couldn't keep the CDs in the bookstore there so that that school in particular you know they they just had this massive they were I mean they were a DC talk kind of school. But you had a large sect of those kids who, and I showed him the ticket. We went to see uh, Prayer Chain at in Bartlesville at the warehouse with the 77s, yeah. well, and uh, that was a phenomenal show. But we've had we had like maybe 50 people come from the school, and there was a huge group of these of the, this same crowd of people who were like, you know what, this this stuff is not really for me. You know, like right. this these are our people, so. Uh, and I feel like it's probably that way at a lot of schools like that, really. We played there one time and a tornado actually went through right <clears> through <throat> as we were sound like checking. The, the roof, like, <laughs> yeah. like, you didn't record well, we, it? We, heard, we, we kind of heard like a rumbling on the roof. Yeah, and we're like, What's that? And then there's like, like dust from the roof climb, coming down. <laughs> and then we saw like the rumble from the roof sort of travel along the whole roof of this Whoa. warehouse. And then we're like, what was that? You know? And they open up the big like um, you know, delivery um, gate thing and we look out there and there's this huge funnel cloud just like destroying trees as it's like going down. Oh my god. Cool. <laughs> what are what are the last two songs? The last three are Mansur Bay, Bendy Line, and Sunstone. Alright. These are the most controversial Bendy songs. The Bendy Line lyrics written by Steven. Mm -hmm. Melody written by and Melody. Steve Penelon. Mm -hmm. He had some experience doing that, so <laughs> <laughs> we heard that he had written this song before. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing real just real fast is just play it is just I don't want to drown out here. Keep talking. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> no, no, I'm oh, sorry. No, just <clears throat> No, it's just, it's, it's kind of weird because, like, the original record, we wanted to have, like, the, the love and sex section, and this is, like, sort of kind of left over from that, and so, 
it always feels like a little bit awkward and contrived, like in the context of like how we had it actually, you know, you know sit, submit it to reunion. So that's it. What do you mean? Because Loverboy is taken off, or what do you mean? Yeah, we have Loverboy, Chalk, and Antarctica. Yeah, all the like there was a the whole backside was supposed to be just like you know it was romance. Oh, Japan! <laughs> 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 and now, you know, you got this. So, all right. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! As you may say, the abbreviated version. Yeah. It's just one of the No, that's what it is. I mean, it's just, it, it bums me out that they took all, like, the whole thing was planned out, like, it was, like, designed, and now it's. I know, I know. I'm sure what I'm talking about. Oh. Am I touching you too much, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> You're like so good looking, man. All right, here we go. Producer. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
couple, a couple technical notes about those that I love is that Manta Ray, Bendy Line, as Steve was describing earlier, the, the manual nature of mixing, those were mixed, those are two songs that were recorded one right after the other on tape and mixed in one shot. And that, we only did one pass. Yeah. And everyone was like, did you get your part? Did you get your part? Yeah, pretty much. So, like, that was it. There's only that, that part, you mean like every, every, people were at different stations? Yeah, everyone had their okay, station. You like, got the, yeah. the, the tambo thing, you got to turn that thing down. So yeah. part, you know, background vocals got to go up, and then somebody else is doing lead vocals. So that was, that was just one. All on 16 tracks. 24. 24, 24 tracks. And well, we have which yeah, leads wait, me to wait. my next note, which is Sunstone. There is no low bass ever. <coughs> because we ran out of tracks. Oh, man. We, Eric did the high bass line, which goes for the whole song. As he was saying, he just played that to a click by himself, like completely, you know, not inspired by anything. Just like, hey, man. I think, down like a, like a, I think I did like a brushes thing on that, like that, yeah. that thing that comes in at the second verse yeah, that, that with the like brushes on like a little tiny thing. And so we get to the end of it, we recorded all that stuff, and we're like, hey, man, we should do like a big low bass note towards the end. It's like, uh, we're out of tracks. Well, what can we get rid of? Nothing. Wow. We had keep all this stuff. So it's like, we had 24, but you had a click track that took up one track. And you had, um, if you were going to be automated, you had what, what they call a safety track. But we didn't, and we weren't, so that didn't count. And usually there was something that was one track that was malfunctioning, right? Right. If they burnt out or whatever. So generally you had 22 tracks. It's not a lot, you know. Uh, you know. Yeah. Not for a seven. Guys that work on Pro Tools now. We had to have, we had to have all those percussion tracks. We had to have all of them. I mean, the Beatles did, you know, Sarge and Pepper's Lonely Heart Club span of four tracks. But, you know. Yeah. We, we, at the time, of course, we didn't, we thought that was a lot of tracks. We didn't think that there was, around the corner was, you know, we didn't know what was coming. We just thought this is great. We got all these tracks. We got to make these decisions. We didn't think we were limited at the time. I never thought I was limited. Now looking back, I realize, oh, look at all that sonic clarity we had. Yeah, no limited. wonder all these these songs don't sound, sound like shit because they're like they're like ninety six tracks. Uh, what's the word for it? Auto tuning and auto pitch correction and everything is exactly on every beat all the time. Well, there's something else about recording on tape. Every time you play the tape, technically a little bit of the material sloughs off. And it, it collects eventually, like, and you have to, you know, keep cleaning it off. So the first thing you record gets played the most, and it's going to be what the result is usually that it gets darker as it goes along. So. You uh, say you record drums first, you got really bright cymbals. By the time you're laying down the final background vocal track, it's all darkened a little bit by that sloughing, right? And digital recording doesn't have every frequency on every track is kept all the time. So in the analog thing, you would have that on the tape happening when the cable it ran through would diminish the tone a little bit. It's going through a channel, and that channel happens to be a little wacky, and it's got a weird, you know, diminishing some of the sound. So everything is isolating and diminishing some of the frequency response. And that's actually what makes it clearer and more separate. Whereas now when you have a 24 tracks of digital where everything has every frequency, it's hard to get separation because when you have everything has everything, then you basically have, uh, you, Yeah, you dilute the noise. impact of the other thing. Yeah. Know, by, oh, I mean, I remember, you know, one of our early records, a guy named Mark Hurd, which was, uh, Mixing, you ever heard of Mark Hurd? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he was like mixing something for us. It was an album we did called Chase the Kangaroo. And I'm like, what have you done to my floor tom? My fl I, I came up behind him, I'm like 24, 23 or whatever, and I'm like, what did you do to my floor tom? I feel, have you got some gizmo? I told him, you've got some gizmo attached to it that's sucking the life out of you. <laughs> I said that to him. And he said, he soloed it for me. He soloed my floor tone. You know, you get that solo button, you know, the solo thing. Boom. It was like, boom. Boom. I'm like, yeah. And then he plays it in the song, and then he lets everything play, and it's like, thud, thud. Yeah. Because everything else is going on, you yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, it's like, oh. And the con I'm, I'm sitting here playing the drum. I'm the drummer. I'm like going, pat, boom, 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 boom. 
Then when I, when I hear the, everybody playing, it's like, thud, thud, you know, because it's like, I'm just part of the whole. And so right. it's hard to realize. The more that's going on, the less, you, the, you know, it's only so, so many sonics can be heard. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the less stuff on tape, the more clarity, the better stuff sounds. With all, without all the stuff piled upon, piled upon. The sloughing and the all that, just a technical note for anybody who's nerdy like me, will... Uh, like a band like Smashing Pumpkins, when they're making like Siamese Dream, they would have, they'd record a bunch of drum mics and and get the drum tape and have like, see we're talking about Simpty, so they'd have one track that was striped with this time code and mm -hmm. then they'd have another tape machine of 24 more tracks mm -hmm. with time code and then a box that kept those two in sync. And so they'd record every mic they could on the drums and once they got the tape, they'd bounce that all down to two tracks on the other machine and then, then fill out everything else. Mm -hmm. And then when it came time to mix, they'd bring that tape back, sync the machines up again, and they'd have this fresh drum track that hadn't been played 4,000 times when right. the organ was overdubbing every guitar part or whatever. So mm -hmm. that's how they... Not to mention you, you, you could actually continue to mix the yeah. separate stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, exactly. So that was how they combated that when they did big records like Chinese Dream and stuff. But for us, it was like, yeah, you, by the time you're getting towards the end of the mix, you're rolling the tape every time, the last mix, and it's like that one thing, the first thing we recorded has been played. Every vocal check, you know, rewind, do it again, do it again, like it's sloughing off sound the whole time. It's a weird thing. So at the very end of Sunstone, um, there's like two drum tracks that come in, and so the one that I played is on the right, and the one that Steve played is on the left, and that was like, uh, let's see. So I think we were both in the basement, right? You were in the basement. I was in the basement. One yeah. was in the regular drum room. The was in the oh, okay. You, we, so, yeah. So I was in the basement. You were in the so drum room. We played, room. I, I believe, at one one pass simultaneously. Yeah, it was one take. Each guy only had one mic on too. Nice. Oh, is that right? Yeah. No, wow. I thought that uh, I thought that his kit was sort of because we still had mics on the kit, and I think. You were on that kit, and then there was only like one mic or two mics on the, the yeah. kit that I was on. And it may have been the brown mic after all. On one no, you're just mic. making all this shit up. No. <laughs> <laughs> but who comes in with the fill? That's you? I come in with the fill because I, I remember thinking, like, I gotta be the one who's like, I, I gotta miss signal that this is where we're gonna start here. Because I can't see him. Yeah, can't and see I can't be like, oh, here we go, right here, yeah. you know? I gotta like give him like a big fill or something. You're the basement with one mic, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what, yeah, you know, something like that. Yeah. So I was like, I gotta do a big fill, you know. But we did, yeah. So we in the album with Wayne and me. Your left speaker, I'm right speaker, or I'm uh, left speaker, your right speaker. You're over there, and I'm over here. Yeah. So I guess. Um, <laughs> if people have to, to if they have their, sp their speakers wearing right, right, right. 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 <laughs> One guy if is playing more tom. One guy plays like a tom beat, and one guy's doing. Well, it was kind of both because I mean, if you listen to him, if you listen to him closely, um, I think there's a certain part where uh, we're both kind of playing like a you know beat thing. We're like, yeah, this is oh, look at this, <laughs> and then like, and then I sort of go into like a something that has some toms in it, and then yeah. like later, Steve just starts like just doing like tom like a tom like, yeah, and like stopping, yeah. burr, burr. You know, and it just sounds like totally kooky with the two things, yeah. which is the whole point of it. You know, I mean, us both playing the same thing was going to sound stupid. Yeah. And at the beginning of that track, you can hear some kind of radio Chip talking in the background. That was whatever we were doing, the drone tracks, Colbert was feeding it through an effects device, and somehow there was a feedback loop going on, and it was picking up radio. You know, so, so it was like not an intentional thing, it was just like, there's radio in the signal. Okay, you know, I guess. there we go. That's it. So what's the organ? Yeah. Earlier you were oh, saying yeah. it was Farfisa, but I, I don't buy that. It, it sounds like it's continental. Oh, that's yeah, what it was. It was, yeah. it was a little thing. Yeah. yeah. And didn't Colbert like tape the notes down? Yeah. What you tell? No, you I played, you played I the part when you got recorded. You played the part. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah. Did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because remember the whole point was like. Um, and totally, rightfully so, it was like, you know, the song's going on for this long, it's the same groove, the same thing. And I remember it was like, you were thinking, the chord needs to fucking change, you know, at some point. You know, they were playing the same chord for like 10 minutes. And so, you know, he comes in with the, with the organ, you know, kind of playing the, the root notes and stuff, and playing sort of like a little bit of a line. And then it's like, there's a certain point where it goes to like, 
you know, the the four or whatever it is in the you know in the chord thing. You know There's nothing I mean? else doing that. When you hear, if you feel the music change at all to a different chord, it's only that organ because we didn't have the track for the low bass. So what happened? To do it. I went so out and played it. Yeah, you played it. Yeah. Otherwise, it was like one note. It was a one note thing, but you're like, man, the chord needs to change. So, so you went out and like, you know, played along for like a few bars. You can hear it come in a little bit, and it's there because you, it's the only other thing that's sort of providing that sort of low note thing. And then, you know, and then you made this sort of the, basically the chord change by hitting that. Uh, you know, if the song's in D, it was like a G, or I don't know what what the key is in the song. It's a fun jam. Yeah, basically. But I love this is a rare thing happened for me uh, with this with this band is that like when I produce other bands I am not the drummer in the band I don't ever like I have a thing where I won't even hit the drum I won't even touch the sticks I won't check the snare I won't hit the tom because I don't want the drummer to feel like I'm the drummer I want to let the drummer know you're the drummer you know I dig your style whatever we give them a lot of cur I mean cur you know hey try a different ride symbol or whatever but I won't ever hit a drum personally. Um, but with Wayne, you know, we got into this, uh, with this band, they like just kind of, I don't know how to say it, but I, I became like welcome, became part of it, the thing, you know, like I was in the band, you know, and, and uh, it's a fifth member. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and because so, the inspiration was so strong, you know, and, you know, we, you know, saw you as a mentor, you know, and so I think naturally, you know, we took what you said extremely seriously. <laughs> and so then when it came time to do stuff, like particularly when we started, you know, thinking about doing percussion and stuff, it became a very much like a collaborative thing. Like, what are we going to do? It wasn't like, you know, what am I going to play? And, and that's the end of the game, you know? Yeah, so it was really enjoyable for me, you know, like Mercury, when that song Mercury is my favorite on the record, mm -hmm. and Wayne and I are, are sitting there together playing it, you know, like, you know, we're like, you know, his inch, his knees are like 12 inches from my knees, and we're facing each other, and we, we're playing, I don't remember what I was playing, but you're playing these clay things. Mm -hmm. I remember what you were playing, but I don't remember what I was playing, you know, because I'm looking at you, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh. You were playing like the big, um, the big uh, sort of Native American hand drum things that were like high, but like open on one end. They were sort of narrow. Those two of them, like one was like this, the other one was kind of like this. And so, you know, you were kind of doing the thing on the on the front. And then I was, I think I had like yeah, like a clay thing, and and I was trying to keep sort of like a straight thing while you were doing the the kind of color. Yeah, but it was like this. We were just in this thing. We're laying the the, the vehicle the song was going to ride in. The vehicle song was going to ride it, and we just laid it down. And, oh, it's just like... <laughs> More on Steve. Yeah, no. So, I mean, here's the thing. Like, he's, he's the best part about Persia. Hey, that whole Sunstone, all I was hearing on the whole Sunstone was that bass line. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so it, it's it's sticking with Eric. <laughs> the thing about Steve, as you may or may not have noticed, Steve has involuntary bodily response to music. It's always been that way, right? You play drums, your body moves, you yeah. move. And when you hear something you uh, don't like, you don't even have to like or not like, it's just a response. But yeah, like your body responds either way and it's, it's clear. I think you described yourself one time as having the loudest body language in the world. Yeah. Like you, you described the story of like a guy you didn't like and you were saying goodbye to me and you're like, and I found myself going like, goodbye. Yeah, see you later. Pushed him away. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> But, so when you have a guy like that, you know, first of all, Steve was definitely a referee, um, for, uh, it was a four-way band, everybody has an equal vote, so it's like there's a lot of discussion about stuff, and Steve was there to make sure that the record ideals were upheld in all decisions, you know, you know to, to make sure that was going on and that we didn't kill each other in the process. But also, when you have a guy who responds bodily to things, you know when something is going well because he you know, stands up and goes, oh! You know, like yeah. that's how he responds to so, like when a part kicks in for the first time. And you're like, all right, I guess that was good. That's the, that's the greatest moments yeah. in the studio where like if he goes like, whoa! Okay. Yeah. 
And then you're like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. All right, that was good. Okay, let's do something more. It is very encouraging. And it's also when something goes by and he doesn't like it, it's like, no, his body, his face just goes, no, like that. And you're like, got it. Okay, we're going we're gonna to redo that part. You know, it's, it's clear. And it's awesome because we needed that clarity. I mean, talking about somebody, a producer who saved a record from being something, it could have been an atrocity. You know, but, yeah. yeah. The reality is it was it was actually many things like as it was getting like picked apart and finalized, so it actually has multiple personalities. It does. Like, and you can all the all the songs are out there, you can put your own version together how you like it. <laughs> one, more, one more funny story, well not funny, but it was actually a, an inspiring story involving Steve and we did anyone go to the it was on the Mercury tour. It was at the show here in Nashville. It was like a, I can't remember what the event was. It was a big thing, and there were a bunch of bands playing like downtown, a lot of different stages. And we did the the silver makeup. GMA. It was GMA week. Did, was anybody at that show? Three uh, plays. We, 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 we had the silver paint, yeah, yeah. and we were we were in town. So Steve was able to come to that. That was the one and only time I've actually ever played with Steve. And we donned that silver paint. We had the alien a, shirt as a band, the silver face paint, and we all slicked our hair. Yeah, back. and it was and like more a, sunglasses. It was like, it was on a whim. We're just like yeah, talk about cool. like maybe the day before, or maybe even the day. We're like, you know, what we should do, you know. And then, so, <laughs> so, so, and then Steve was like, brought his percussion. He's ready to you know play and stuff. And then we're like telling him like, well, this is what we're gonna do. And, and you know, Steve was just so easy going. He's like, Okay, you know, <laughs> didn't really it's expect it. I don't think. And then we 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 put that silver paint on. We did the show, but this last portion of the record, those last two songs, Bendy Line is it's it's one of the more complicated ones to play when I was doing the percussion parts mm -hmm. live because there's it's fun to play, but there's a lot going on on the record that just was not possible with just Wayne and I. And so I was having to cover like a lot of extra stuff in there. And I nailed it most of the time, but a couple of nights it, you know, it was like a little, not quite, not off, but just not, we weren't hitting all the stuff, the, you know, the song, all the different things. And Sunstone, obviously it is what it is. It's just, it's just craziness. And so um, that involves a lot of just randomness and things. And, and then those extra rhythm, rhythms and so forth. But, that particular show, Steve's got all this extra stuff, and here I'm, I'm, we're playing, and I'm playing with with Steve now, who like wrote the song, and like the, you know all this, this rhythms and everything are just coming for. So he he knows the stuff, and it's fresh off of that record, and we're playing that that and Sunstone in particular. We just listened to him. I'll never forget that gig because it's we. It was, it, that was like the, I think the last time I even saw you too. It was that long ago. But we did that, and it. That was the only night of the whole Mercury tour where like Benny Line and Sunstone sounded like as epic as the right, record because yeah. we just had like a yeah. noise show going on back there, like appropriately for those particular songs. Mm -hmm. so that was really fun. And I'll add on to that that <laughs> reunion has gotten dissed over the years for making us redo crap and all that, but we're such a hard band to be in the Christian market alongside these bands. And like, that is an example of GMA is the convention. We're all like the Baptist bookstore seller people and the ladies at their Christian radio stations and all these gatekeepers of the Christian industry come to see these Christian bands and our label pays money for us to be at these showcases. And we show up with silver paint and aliens. <laughs> so we want to impress like the conservative Christian movement to like, please sell our records, you know, please yeah. play our song in your radio station. And they're like scared, you know. Yeah. And one other story along those lines is the luncheon, the word luncheon. Well, I'll, you can go to that. But my story is we were booked uh, in Dallas at an event that was created to show youth pastors that this cutting edge alternative music that's Christian is great for the kids and encouraging and it's safe and, oh, and you know, you should book these bands and play your youth group, you know? And it's like Sixpence Done the Richer and us and all these bands. And so we finish our set and me, the business guy of the band, goes to like get paid. 
And these jokers are out in the parking lot and we're with some friends and they're screwing around. And we had loved this CD from the Echoing Green and our friend Joey. And we would play this song, Defend Your Joy. And it was just gross how much this CD got played and became this joke and kind of Jer Jeremy, well, yeah, retreated. I'm getting there. <laughs> Jeremy and Wayne's sense of humor is if you repeat something enough, it will become funny. And it became like, was Nacho. yeah, and it became Defend Your Joy was this song that like Nacho the driver at three in the morning would yeah. just crank in the car as loud as he could over and over again. And yeah, it, it tried to get thrown away before it didn't get it. So we're at a gas station. Wayne leaves the CD on the we, wheel we well. We don't know that. We don't have proof of that. <laughs> there is no evidence. He leaves the CD. There's no, yes, allegedly <laughs> this is what happened. On the wheel well of our trailer, and we take off down the road, never to see the CD again. We discover it. We confront him. His penance is that he's got to make a lap around the van and the trailer naked <laughs> in the parking lot backstage of this show that's designed to show youth pastors and, and, and me the conservative guys off getting paid so what do I come out to see? You just took too long to get paid. That was the no, 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 he's coming to what? No, no, he's you, coming you, to Eric comes running in like, crap dude, you gotta get out there as soon as no, possible. No, no, just say it. Say what you, just do what you did when he walked out. I don't know what I do. Wayne's getting arrested. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I, I go out to the parking lot. There's a cop car. There's lights. There's Wayne in the cop car. And he, he's booking it naked. And around the corner to see a cop car just happen to like yeah. the worst time oh, ever. Oh, yeah. And he gets arrested. And so that's another thing when Chris Smith hauls us on the carpet like, guys, you're not doing us any favors here. <laughs> like, the little Baptist bookstore chain just canceled your CDs and they won't sell them anymore because you're naked backstage. <laughs> you better help me out here. So, so in my defense, <laughs> so the car. So here's the the, no, no, the context. On, right. Yeah, right, right, right here. Right. Wait, 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 wait. Everybody can see me. I'm not like hiding or anything. <laughs> so, so, uh, so. You gotta tell the whole story. Well, that's basically the story. I mean, the, well, you know, because I think Eric, you came to me as like. Dude, the guys know that you did it, so uh, so you need to, as a you know, to pay for your crimes, you need to, you know, you know, we're waiting for a long time. It's, I mean, the, the parking lot is empty, everybody's gone. There's, there's, there's nobody in this parking like, lot. There's not a soul around, and like we're just waiting. By the way, because I didn't think it was a, a punishment that fit the crime at all. Like, <laughs> it was like this was minimal. <laughs> right, I know. Yeah, you and Nacho were very fond of that CD. I was not. Anyway, so, um, so, 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 uh, so I'm like, I probably thought the same thing. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. No problem. There's nobody around. Well, who cares? This is, I'm like, yeah, I'm getting off easy. So, um, so, so I remember, t I remember taking off and running around or whatever, and I was like, ha, 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 ha. I just got off so easy, you know. Nah, nah, nah. And I turn the corner and I just hear Eric yelling. Cops! Cops! <laughs> and, I, and I turn the corner and I see there's a somehow out of absolutely nowhere there's a police car that has gone head to head with our van and I'm going from the back of the trailer towards it, you know, right towards the cop and I'm just like, oh. So I just cut right in front of the cop car and I start booking it for the exit, which is like 200 yards away or something. <laughs> and you know, of course, like you know, or, or Eric's is like, just go, just go, or or, or no, uh, some friends had a car, and so I jumped into the car, and so yeah. we we took off, and they stopped us at the gate, and all that stuff. And so, <laughs> then that was, you know, then all that mess happened. Yeah, tell the whole story though. I have one little question to make it that no, 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 was mentioned, but on the list, the ticket had a, a list of oh, yeah, yeah. offenses, oh, yeah. and a list of crimes on it, like a crime ticket on the back. And yeah. Wayne looks at it and goes. 
man, I would have been fined less for prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fine was like 300 bucks or something like that, and it was like, it was like assault was like 100, and like prostitution was like 150. I was like, what? I got nothing less with this. Yeah. <laughs> Texas. Do you guys, do you guys want to see? Do you guys want to see the full movie or just? Yes. Yeah. All right. So. The movie? Yeah. Movie. Yeah. 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 So Wayne bucks <laughs> around the whole thing. Are you getting naked right now? now? <laughs> 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 no. 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 So Wayne gets arrested, right? <laughs> But also that same day, a friend of ours gave Wayne a, a t-shirt. Oh, that's right. No, that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a, whatever, a softball shirt or whatever. Like a sleeve. softball shirt. Three <laughs> yeah, three points. Like red sleeves and like yeah. a white. Yeah. And, and they then put, in put rainbow on. letters it said Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Wayne, Wayne is not... I got my corduroy flared yeah. pants, but, brown pants, yeah. but no longish shoes, hair. Nothing you just have since the Wayne shirt and the corduroy jeans. Cop comes up. And I'm on, I got my hands in the car. And I, oh, by the way, as I'm like doing that and the cop is standing there, I'm looking over and these guys are just doubling over in laughter. And I'm like, I cannot look at them. The cop, I'm going to start laughing and the cop is really going to get mad at me. So I'm just going to focus. All right, so here we go. So I'm Wayne now. I'm wearing the Wayne shirt. I'm on the car. And the officer's like, oh, I have to give him my, my license. He's like, uh, you have any ID on you? Like, Let Eric tell the story. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. So he's like up there, and like, oh, do you have ID? Yeah, in my back pocket. <laughs> out. Okay, they're looking at it. Yeah. What's your name? And Wayne goes like, uh, Wayne? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole time the cop's like, the cop goes, do you always put your nail in your shirt? And he's like, oh, no. <laughs> that was like the whole thing. is just like, oh, what's your name? <laughs> Wayne? <laughs> and then they, the, they cuffed him and put him in the car. And then like an hour later, they let him go. <laughs> but yeah, the whole time it's like, what's your name? <laughs> I remember Andy saying later because I had like the kind of like the longish, almost feathered hair and like the you know super seventies outfit. He's like, man, it looked like some sort of drug bust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean there was not a soul in the whole. No, I swear there was no one in that park. Yeah, it was like a promise yeah. keepers thing. <laughs> and like we're like the only people there, and you ran around naked. I disagree. That's it. Well, okay, you were the other person. There was ten there. cars there. Oh man, it was awesome. That was our ministry. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> that was our ministry. <laughs> Wait. So, do you always put your name on your clothes? <laughs> no. Uh, speaking of the, you know, being ostracized because of aliens and silver and things, I just thought about when you were, Jeremy, when you were talking about Gilead earlier, you mentioned, you said something about randomness and brokenness when you're describing that song. And I, I don't know, I just thought like that, I, this album came out when I was. A senior in high school, and um, I didn't know what I was listening to as a eighteen-year-old kid. Mm. But I knew that it that I knew there was randomness and brokenness, and I knew that it was expressing something that was missing. Yeah. And so this is not a question. This is just an encouragement to you guys. And I just wanted to thank you for mm. creating a piece of art that I would argue is more Christian than. Because, of, because it expresses <laughs> because of the way you guys uh, because of the way you guys were able to express brokenness with this piece of art in a way that I would say is more Christian than most of what was being marketed as Christian music back then. So thank you for that. I would that. say that that will happen if you don't if you do something and you don't have anything to lose. Like we were at the point where we knew we were gonna be done. So this that this record was like, so what do we got to lose? We're gonna be done anyways. You know what I mean? And so there was no holding back. It was and you can do that kind of work when you have that kind of freedom. I didn't know that we were gonna be done. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like done with the label or done as a band? Just Maybe they're gonna get some, some, all of it. All of it. You know yeah. what? All the information was disclosed. It was just in French, and it was really. <laughs> 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 
Every week. That's, that's, that's why you got. The, that's why the record hit you that way. Is because we did a record where we literally. I mean, we got to do whatever kind of the heck we wanted. Yeah. And meaning not got to, but we just did. We just sort of forced that upon everybody, and that rarely happens. People are always mm -hmm. going like, you know, well, we should cater to, or we should hold back, or any of that stuff. We didn't hold anything back. No, so we were young like, enough not to give a fuck. Yeah. And, you know. So that was very important. Very, because very. And then as I went on to be a producer, trying to replicate things that I learned from Steve, I would have bands tell me stuff like, well, I just want to, and I'd be like, I got it. Like, I understand, because I, well, I did that with the band. But if you actually want to sell records, you might want to consider trying this, you know, stuff. And it's like, oh, I want to do what I want. And I could never say no to that. So I'm like, well, I get it, man. Like, we make the record you want to which, hear. Yeah. Make the record you want to hear. John, John, where's John? John, the long haired dude. Uh, yeah. dude. Just ask me, you know, I, I love to, this, this interaction with people that listen closely. And John was asking me, he said to me, what if there's one thing you changed about Christian music? And I thought, I'm like, what Christian music? I mean, sound of that just like, oh, it makes me cringe. It made me cringe back then. It makes me cringe now. I don't even know what that is. I don't want to hear it. The very idea of it is like, oh, you know, but, um, and I just right away he's saying that it's like, be, be honest, be honest, be honest. The one thing I could change about it, why do I hate it? Basically, what, why do I hate it so much? The genre. Same thing, reason I hate country music. It's just like this honest, it's targeting a, a tiny minded demographic. And it has nothing to do with the truth. It's how do I really feel? Talk about what you really feel. Tell the truth. Doesn't It's a complete disservice to anyone to say you feel some way you don't feel. So say I'm walking around thinking about God today because I might get a, a cut on you know, whoever's album or whatever it is. It's just like... well, we played a show, one of our experiences on tour, was playing a show and the guy that booked us, it was a youth groupy kind of show and he was like, so you guys, you know, say something, do an altar call? We're like, no, we don't do that stuff. We just we play our music and that's what we do. And he's like, well, if the spirit leads, you know, like, well, yeah, but that's not gonna happen. He goes, well, I'd, I'd like for the spirit to lead you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, we were like, that's, those kinds of interactions happen a lot. We realized, maybe we're in the wrong place, you know, like, we're, yeah. like mm -hmm. us doing the, what we want to do in this context just is not a, a match. Well, you know? you know, when we all, uh, you know, started the band and like, we loved like bands like The Mission UK and The Stone Roses and Jane's Addiction and all these bands that really were inspiring to us. And um, yeah, working with their ministry. What's that? With their ministry. With their ministries? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, of course not. Um, but like, you know, we just wanted to be a band just like any other band. We had like spiritual themes that we wanted to talk about and things, but there was no, there was nothing about like, there was, we never felt like it was, there was an evangelistic um, part of, of our music. It was merely we were going to talk about the things that we wanted to talk about. Some of them were spiritual, some of them were not. And that was just the way it was going to be. And, and just like Andy said, you know, we would be put in these situations that were like, you know, we would like you to use your music as a tool of manipulation. And that for us, that was really uncomfortable and we didn't do it. You know, there would be you know times when someone would come on after we played or whatever, because, you know, we play at churches all the time and stuff. And someone would do like a, you know, thing. And that wasn't our thing, you know, I mean, and then, uh, so, you know, I think part of what it means is, is that it led us in a way to, I think by the time we were, uh, we did Shawl and then uh, toured a lot and then, um, you know, had a lot of interactions with, you know, people around the country. It was, you know, our first time that we got to go to other parts of the country, you know, um, in a large extent. Um, and just saw the way that the Christian music scene was. And for us, that was a very, very weird thing. You know, it was just not really a, a, an integral part of what we considered ourselves to be in terms of the, our band, you know? I mean, that was, that was maybe a part of our personal lives, but it wasn't a part of like our, our group or anything. So um, I think by the time you get done touring with uh, and dealing with a lot of that kind of culture and the the weird sort of microcosm that Christian music is and things that Steve was talking about, you know, and it's just like this very bizarre thing 
and we felt very isolated because we were really not, you know, we didn't buy the whole thing hook, line, and sinker, and it was, we felt like we were supposed to do that. And so that was a part of our sort of feeling of alienation and uh, isolation, which were part of the themes that ended up, you know, becoming a part of this. And then we would find out after the fact that we had connected with certain people, like you mentioned, we'd get feedback every yeah. once in a while in handwritten letters, like what you said, and be like, mm -hmm. I guess that's what we're doing. Like we didn't know intentionally that that's what was happening, but we kind of started to piece it together after a while. And we're like, oh, there's that one guy or girl. And we knew in the youth group that that's what we're doing. And we knew when we were going to go out on that Mercury tour, we knew that this was going to be a hard record for people to swallow. Yeah. And we knew that it was going to be really the people who got it that were going to come and you know be excited about it. And of course, it was a much smaller audience than the Shawl audience. But you know, we knew those ones were like those were our people. You know, I used to do. Uh, I did. A, I did promotions in Louisville, and I had I actually brought you guys in for a couple different tours. And uh, <laughs> we uh, we brought it was me and Corey Boston worked together to bring you guys into Louisville to play like I don't was it called Southeast or was it yeah. in, well, okay yeah. Southeast and so. You guys were playing like in this youth center, it was like this big concrete kind of space and Corey was younger and they'd asked me to come in because I was a little bit older and I had done production for like other, you know, brought in other bands from around in the city. So as you guys were, were playing songs off this record, <laughs> like parents were getting phone calls and like people were like, what is going on with it? They had no idea what was going on on stage. So I got pulled to the back with Corey and there's like church folks and parents and people showing up in the back and like they're they're asking they're they're just like concerned like <laughs> as to the level of like the loudness and like the band playing and I'm just trying to like work through and I'm I was probably like I don't know like 20 20 I don't know trying to be the, the responsible person in the room so I'm dealing with the I'm, I'm like I want to like jump in there and like you know just totally rock out with the kids but then I'm also dealing with like you know like the pressure of like people coming and ask me so there's this anxiety rising and so I kind of miss like the last three or four songs and I'm just trying to be really diplomatic and work through it and Corey which was a friend of Jay's he was like he was younger, he was like 18, and he was just like, bust. he didn't know what to say. He just was like, I, they're, they're awesome, you know, do whatever. And so I'm like trying to just work through all this stuff that like we're talking about, like beautiful artwork, and they have a different, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of coming at this differently, they're great, blah, blah, blah. And as, as you guys are dying down, and like, I don't know, like you came off the stage or whatever, there's like more and more of these adults are kind of like, and I'm like, now I'm nervous. I'm really trying to like confuse their like anxiety. And I turn around and Wayne has on these glasses. And I think your hair is like in pigtails, but somehow you put your shirt over your head. Not over your face, but like, you know, over your head. So your belly was out and somebody was behind you slapping. <laughs> and this was like right next to me. And, they, and the, the main person was like, what is that? And I'm like, they're awesome. <laughs> Hiding his identity from the police. <laughs> <'cause they're bad. laughs> there was a there was a real like um, there was a real period for me personally where I was just like I just did not get, I knew I didn't get the Christian music scene thing and I was just I was frustrated by just feeling so different and just not a part of that thing and and so one of my ways of rebelling and, and just lashing out at it was to write voodoo on my chest. <laughs> and, uh, I did that for like 10 shows or something like that. And there was a very, let's just say it was, there was a very mixed response within the band. And then there was an extremely adversarial response from the audience. <laughs> yeah. And so there was one of the, one of the, one of the trips was, is in New York. We played in Nyack, New York. And, um, and we played. Uh, uh, I can't remember what happened. Was it but my place? No, it was. It was at. A, it, was it was at a, a college there. Oh, so it was a college. It was in the main. Yeah, it was like Judita. Yeah. Judita booked it. I think. And these people rarely had Christian music artists up in their area at that point. So I, mean, oh. we, I think we opened for like the seventy-seven or somebody. Or yeah. Because yeah, I remember Mike going. Ah. 
That voodoo thing, that's classic. <laughs> that's just what Mike does. He, he's like, he's laughing, but you're not exactly sure if he's mocking you or he's with you, you know? He's just kind of like, oh, that's great. That's so great. Ha ha ha! And you're like, oh, that seemed too strong. Great job, boy. So, uh, so I got, so... So I'm trying to like, we open, so I'm trying to drag all my stuff off of the stage, you know, all the, all the drums and stuff, and I hear these people in the front of the, of the, uh, 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 the front of the stage, like, like, hey, drummer, hey, drummer, hey, hey, what's with the voodoo? Hey, drummer, what's with the voodoo? You know, and I'm just like, um, oh, just a second, you know, I got to get my drums and stuff, and I'm like, guys, I got to go out and talk to these people, but I think I might get my ass kicked. <laughs> so, so I go out and... And I'm, so I'm starting to walk out to where I think I'm going to get my ass kicked, and I'm walking through the crowd, and this lady sort of grabs me by the arm. She goes, excuse me, I just wanted to say that I was very offended by you up there. <laughs> first of all, first of all, you're half naked up there. You're half naked, and then you got voodoo written across your chest. <laughs> What's that all about? I was like, well, you know, it's just, I just, you know, it's just kind of a, I don't know, it's not a thing, you know, and I sort of got out of it somehow. And then I go out to the, to the parking lot where I think I'm going to get my ass kicked. And so I go up and talk to the guy, because this guy was very vocal, and he had like a vest on, I think, if I remember correctly. And he was like, hey, you, yeah, you're the guy, right? Yeah, okay, so... Let me tell you something right now, okay? You know, and he goes through this very long like story, like this is, and um, and he's and he goes through. He talks like, look, I was in five gangs, okay? I was in five gangs, and I was delivered from that life by the Lord, and everything happened for me. And you know, he goes through this big long story for like ten minutes, and I'm sitting there going, like, when's he gonna kick my ass? I don't know. I'm not sure yet. And so finally, gets to the end of the story, and that was all he wanted to say to me. You know, I was like. Where's the part where you don't like the voodoo thing? <laughs> it's like, it, and he just wanted to tell me his story. <laughs> so it ended up being harmless, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you have Adam again, some of the bands that came along like you guys. There, there is a margin and a space now for a band like the Prayer Chain within Christian music. Right. So if you guys... People paving the way. Yes. For, for so, so let's say... Ten years down the road, would would it have looked different for you guys if you had come on the scene about ten years later than what you did, or do you think it would have still been disillusionment and that. things yeah. like that? Yeah, it would now. Because Tim is in that industry. Not not that I care. I just find it to be an interesting question. Well, first of all, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the guy. Yeah. You're the guy that just asked that, right? The guy. Yeah. <laughs> I think that. The Christian music scene changed because in our day you had like Tooth and Nail and certain things coming mm -hmm. out and, and you could be an indie band, a punk band, a hardcore band, whatever, and there's people of faith in the band and all of a sudden you're called a Christian band and you're on a Christian label and blah, blah, blah. But soon after that, the industry started changing where if you're a really good punk rock fan, you just go get signed to Capitol. And you bypass the Christian market, mm -hmm. and if your lyrics were relevant enough, you'd come back into the Christian market through Christian bookstores because Capital One sells more records or something. Right. You know, and if you're Paramore, you just go break. And so the huh. the current day thing is, I think you either got to be super duper Christiany, designed for the church, new Worship. voice. It's well, our, our entire point of a band is to encourage the body of Christ through stories about life and how God redeemed me or something, mm -hmm. some very, very direct thing, or your worship music, your Hillsong United, your Chris Tomlin, whatever, and anything that's like, we're just going to be a creative band, but we believe in Jesus, that's not a Christian market thing anymore. <laughs> like that's like you just gotta go make it in the clubs and you gotta write good songs and you gotta compete with everybody because the Christian market isn't designed that way and I think if we were around that time we'd have been spurred on and driven just to make it on our own outside of this bubble that had expectations on us and it probably would have been a healthier place for us because we would have either failed and flamed out and sucked and we couldn't compete at this level 
or we would have just competed on a musical level where it wasn't about like can you encourage the body of Christ or are you a worshiping or whatever it's just like are you good at art you know do you write captivating songs and it might have been a better space because like Wayne said like not every song on the prayer chain was about our faith some of them were some of them were about feeling numb or revenge or whatever but like Steve said there was a truth in the lyric mm -hmm. and I think that resonated with you guys in this room that's probably why you're here and it might have resonated with people outside of that Christian bubble and we did play some clubs and do some of that but we kept getting drawn back to this thing because that's where our label was that's where our connections were and it was that's where our friendships were at that point. Like that yeah could, we could be a band in that industry but if I had to do it all over again and Eric like had told me like I think breaking up is a mistake. I don't think it's our time. I think God wants us to continue. Did Eric said that? Yeah. And um, I think like some of the reason that we broke up was like me kind of being self-righteous and feeling like um, self-conscious about what we were struggling with and who we were and playing youth group shows. Huh. You know, there's like a lot of pressure like in, in your 25 years old and you're like an adult and you're like you want to go have a beer or something but there's the youth group thing and I, I was conflicted there so it could have just been like hey let's just not do this Christian music thing and either reunion who's owned by some mainstream secular label either ships us over to that or we get dropped and we go try to do it on our own merit you know and I always I kind of wish we would have tried that. And I think that's one big reason we didn't is because I had blinders on and I couldn't see that that was like an option. A band like Chevelle did that. And they, yeah, they were yes. pretty successful after they switched over. Yeah. yeah. So do you all have any desire to make any... Tulsa, what Yes. <laughs> uh, do you have any desire to make any new music? Wayne really wants to, but I just said no. Wayne did It's like trying to bust my balls. Wayne man. said, I'd like to take a month off from my paid job and pay my rent. So <laughs> when I was talking to you in California about doing the record, you said Wayne got a job. Oh, did you change your mind? So who's the hold out here? I kickstart that ish. <laughs> you, uh, Another 20 grand. <laughs> Every person in the room paid one thousand dollars. What do I sign? We have our That's new credit card. 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 Yeah. Wait, this is a timeshare thing. <laughs> you all are paying for this time. <laughs> Steve's more than three grand now. Yeah, a little bit, but, but you know, I'm actually. <laughs> God of Wonder subsidized Persian right? <laughs> <laughs> Joel. I just had a question about uh, the Mercury tour. When I saw you guys in uh, Elgin, at one of them barn, you guys were playing, like on, at, the bottom, at the top of like a massive ticket, it was like the throws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you guys, Morelos Forest. Plank guy. Plank guy. Okay. Okay. So this, that's actually what this question's about. So you guys were about to go on stage, and Plank guy was on right before you, and the dude from Plank guy, I don't remember his name, Scott. 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 Yeah, that dude. He said he was like he was like, yeah, man, we're so happy you came out to see us and the prayer chain. Cause prayer chain's not going to be a band for very much longer anymore. And like <laughs> it was the first like I had ever heard of it. Instead of like it was the first any everybody in the entire crowd had ever heard. Of it. So I was like, no. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering like if you guys remember that if it was like if he spilled the beans for you guys or you guys were trying to keep under a hat or if it was like I don't think there was any hat. I think we do. Or there was any yeah I mean there wasn't any hat but there was it wasn't like we were like really being very. Thinking about, I mean, it just wasn't like, oh, we're gonna break up at a certain point. Hammer, like, hey, 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 must have spent yeah. the guy forty bucks just to. Write it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Scott said it. I guess it's done. <laughs> I know there's more questions, but I want to be sensitive to people's time. I know Brad has to drive to Atlanta, and so 
we could do like official ending, but like we're not going anywhere. Yeah. And you want to like, stay so. in Orange County? We just hung out, but if you feel like awkward that you leaving, like you don't have to feel awkward. So we'll be officially over, but we'll just be hanging out if you want to talk about cool guitar gear with Andy. Or... I've, brought, I've brought a bunch of percussion into my car. I feel like bringing it in and seeing, you know. Oh, Oh my I have some peyote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, that would be How many tracks do we have to record? Peyote, if Tim had brought it. Yes, I, mean, I would feel like I would have to do that. Because that would never happen in any universe. Hey, come here, one. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Alright, this is... Alright, this, this feels terrible, but like... If you guys want to take photos, this is probably the time, right? Alright, wait, wait, wait. Is your name like Tim? Alright, wait, wait, wait. Is your name like Tim? 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 Is